Go ahead, Counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, the state calls Dr. Heather Gerald. All right. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Would you please state your name for the record and spell your last name, please? Dr. Heather Gerald. And what's your current occupation? J-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Oh, there you go. I'm the chief medical investigator at the Office of the Medical Investigator. Okay. And what are your primary responsibilities as the chief medical examiner at OMI? I oversee the operations of the OMI, including approximately 200 employees and the forensic pathologists who are there. In addition, I also perform autopsies to determine the cause and the manner of death. Great. Can you give us a, a brief explanation about your educational background? Sure. I have a bachelor's degree uh, from Valdosta State University in Valdosta, Georgia. Then I went to medical school at Mercer University School of Medicine in Macon, Georgia, where I graduated with a medical degree. Then I completed a residency in anatomic pathology at the University of Virginia, and I'm board certified in anatomic pathology. Then I completed a fellowship, which was a two-year fellowship in neuropathology at the same institution, and I'm board certified in neuropathology. And then lastly, I completed a forensic pathology fellowship at the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, and I'm board certified in forensic pathology. Can you explain to the jury what forensic pathology is? A forensic pathologist performs autopsies to determine the cause and the manner of death. And what about anatomical pathology? A person who is an anatomic pathologist uh, can perform autopsies usually in a hospital setting to determine um, what caused death, um, but they also can uh, determine, like, for example, if you have surgery and have something removed, let's say a, a, a cancerous lesion, the pathologist is the one who determines what type of, of cancer it is or, or disease it is. And approximately how many autopsies have you performed in your career? I have performed and supervised over 3,500 or 3,500 examinations plus about 500 neuropathology consultations. And have you had any training uh, specific to injury analysis? Can you be more specific? Um, just training in terms of determining how uh, how an injury may have affected uh, an individual's body and how that may have contributed to the person's death? Uh, yes, that would be included in my forensic pathology fellowship. Great. And have you ever testified in court uh, as an expert witness in the fields of forensic and anatomical pathology? Yes. Approximately how many times? More than 50 times. Great. Uh, and have you rendered opinions in, uh, in prior cases in regarding homicides that involved guns? Yes. All right. 
And does this include testifying to the entry and exit of gunshot wounds? Yes. All right. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd move the court to recognize uh, Dr. Gerald as an expert witness in the fields of forensic and anatomical pathology. Yes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gerald, would you explain to the jury exactly what is an autopsy? An autopsy examination consists ultimately of two parts, both an external examination and an internal examination. In the external examination, we we document you know, features of the decedent, such as hair color, eye color, weight, and stature. But we also document any injuries that we see externally. We take measurements of those injuries and we classify those injuries. The second part of the autopsy is the internal examination. I also neglected to mention that during the external examination, we collect um, trace evidence in suspicious cases. That might include fingernail clippings um, and hair samples. The internal examination consists of blood collection for toxicology when applicable and looking at every internal organ individually to look for injury and again classifying that in type of injury and also looking for natural disease findings. We also make um, microscopic slides as a result of that internal examination which we analyze by looking through a microscope and we form a, a final report with the ultimate goal of determining the cause and the manner of death. Thank you. And does every person who dies receive an autopsy? No. So what, what, um, how do you determine whether or not you're going to perform an autopsy? An autopsy, uh, I'll, I'll back up and, and explain that a little bit more. Um, within the state of New Mexico, the OMI is notified of all sudden and unexpected deaths. And for cases that are non-natural, there are certain circumstances where the OMI will take jurisdiction. And so in the case of deaths resulting from gunshot wounds, um, this is an example where the OMI or the Office of the Medical Investigator will take jurisdiction. And in possible homicides, um, the, uh, the OMI will perform an autopsy. Thank you. Um, can you explain to us what is the intake process when, when a body arrives at OMI, what is that intake process like? Uh, when a body arrives at the OMI, um, the body is received in a, in a sealed body bag so that chain of custody is maintained from the scene to the OMI um, to ensure that no one's tampered with anything inside the body bag. Um, we break the seal and we have um, a machine at the OMI called a CT scanner, just like in a hospital if you have to get a CAT scan and the body at the OMI receives a full body CT scan. This allows us to have a look inside the body before we actually open the body. For gunshot wound cases, it lets us know if there's a gunshot wound track and if there is a retained projectile. And so that is a, um, the beginning of the intake process. Thanks, and, and I'm gonna get into some greater detail about the CT scan in this case and further questions, um, but right now, describe to us with, as part of the intake process, do, is it typical for sometimes for items to arrive along with the decedent's body? Yes. So what, what, might, what might arrive? Um, per our state statute, anything present on the body should come with the body. Um, in this case, there were personal belongings that in included clothing um, that came present with Ms. Hutchins' body. Great. Um, do you gather any statements uh, prior to conducting an autopsy? If law enforcement is present to view an autopsy, which is not uncommon, um, I will usually ask if they have any questions before I start, and I will communicate autopsy findings to anyone who is there to view autopsy. Um, we also, before I issue cause and manner of death, when relevant, will review law enforcement reports. So you mentioned kind of the external examination. Is there another step to the autopsy process? There is the internal examination. Right. 
And can you explain what that is briefly? During the internal examination, uh, we make an incision on the chest and the abdomen to look at the internal organs. Uh, we also make an incision on the head and remove part of the skull to, to look at the brain. Um, as part of the external examination, what, what sort of things are you looking for on the outside of the decedent's body? On the external examination, again, we're looking at um, certain physiological characteristics of the, or physical characteristics of the decedent, but we're also looking for any injuries that might be present, and again, we take measurements of those and we classify what type of injury they are. And how do you document the external examination? The external examination um, is documented. I typically use a, a body diagram and I make notes. If there's any tattoos, I'll document where those are. Um, and then if there's any injuries, I'll document on a body diagram what type of injuries they are. And do you take photographs as part of this? Yes. Thank you. Um, and. Let's talk now a little bit in a little bit more detail about the uh, the internal examination. Um, how do you proceed about conducting an internal examination? Do you, how much detail do you want? Um, just give me an idea in terms of you know are you looking for um, whether the death was caused by an injury versus a natural disease? Just kind of a high level description of what you're looking for. Yes, the, the combination of the external examination and the internal examination are looking at any documented natural disease or injuries. Um, if there are injuries, do they account for death? Is there any natural disease that accounts for death? And again, uh, when we perform toxicology, is there any toxicological cause of death or contributory factors to death? And as part of that, do you ever collect samples of tissue or fluids? Yes. And can you explain that process? Yes, we typically will collect blood uh, to perform toxicology to, in certain cases to determine if that caused death or contributed to death. Uh, as I mentioned before, we also collect hair samples other blood samples that could be used for DNA testing uh, if needed later, and we collect fingernails, uh, clippings for what we call a so-called homicide workup. Perfect. Um, and was an autopsy performed on Helena Hutchins in this case? Yes. And who conducted that, au that autopsy? I did. Great. What was the date of that autopsy? The autopsy was performed on October 22nd, 2021. Great. And how did you identify the decedent as Helena Hutchins? Uh, I believe she was identified by a, a visual identification. We can also do um, comparison to identification, um, like a driver's license. Great. And what was your role in this particular autopsy? Um, I was the person who conducted the full autopsy. Great. So I'm the person who did the external examination and the internal examination, wrote the report, and certified cause and manner of death. Great. So it was you who was ultimately responsible for issuing the findings? Yes. Great. Um, did you review all of the photographs uh, related to the autopsy to form your opinion? Yes. Thank you. Um, were you able to render an opinion regarding the cause and manner of death uh, for Mrs. Hutchins? Yes. And what was your conclusion for cause of death? Uh, death was caused by a gunshot wound of the chest. And what was the manner of death? I certified the manner of death as accident. And can you explain why you classified it as an accident? Yes. I classified the manner of death as accident. Well, let me lift me back up to go to... A homicide is classified as um, a volitional act caused by another to cause fear, harm, or death. Intent is not always needed. It is a common element, but it is not always needed. Um, conversely, for an accident to be applicable, what must, was, what must not be present is an intent um, to cause fear, harm, or death. Looking at the uh, material that was available to me through law enforcement reports, it was apparent to me there was no obvious intent to cause death. It doesn't mean there's no negligence or so on, but it means there was no intent to cause death. Additionally, um, there are medical examiners across this country that would have certified the manner of death in this case as homicide. 
However, reviewing the material that was applicable to me, it is clear that there was a belief on the set that the firearm was not loaded with live ammunition. And based on that belief, and this scenario being much different than what we see in other medical examiner cases for firearm-related deaths, I felt that the manner of death was best class classified as accident. And thirdly, there has been somewhat of a precedent set in a previous movie set shooting death uh, where the manner of death was classified as accident. Great. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, when you first started your testimony that you sometimes perform a, perform a CT scan um, on the decedent's body. Did you perform one in this case? Yes. And what did that scan reveal? Um, the scan revealed that there was no significant natural disease for Ms. Hutchins. It also demonstrated a gunshot wound track. Um, it demonstrated that there was a medical intervention prior to her death in the form of surgical intervention that was conducted at UNMH or, or the University of New Mexico Hospital. And it also demonstrated that there was no retained projectile within Ms. Hutchins' body. Thank you. Uh, when when Miss Hutchins first arrived at OMI, do you recall what she was wearing? She was wearing um, undergarments, and she was wrapped in a hospital blanket. Okay. Did any um, clothing arrive with uh, with her? Yes. And do you do you recall what that was? Yes, there was a a jacket, or I classified it as being a jacket. And there was also a pair of of um, tights and a pair of pants. Great. Um, at this time, Your Honor, I'd like to move for admission of states exhibits 113 and 114, their photographs, and they've been stipulated to by defense counsel. All right, admitted. May I publish them? Yes. All right. Is, is there an image on your screen? Yes. Okay. Um, does that appear to be the jacket that arrived with Ms. Hutchins? Yes. Did you do any examination of this jacket? I did a, a visual inspection. And, and why did you do that? Um, for firearm-related fatalities, we look for uh, defects of the clothing that correspond to any gunshot wounds on the body. Um, in particular, we will look at the defect that corresponds to the gunshot entrance wound, and we look for visible soot or dark particulate material um, that would help us indicate a range of fire. And, and did you find any of that on this jacket? No. Okay. And so what, does, what kind of conclusion can you draw from the absence of gunpowder or that kind of thing? The absence of soot, unburned gunpowder particles, and gunpowder stippling um, on the clothing and or body would indicate a distant or, or an indeterminate range of fire. Indeterminate range of fire would be applicable if there is an intermediate target, meaning that the projectile went through something else before it struck Ms. Hutchins. Um, there was no indication that the projectile went through anything before it struck Ms. Hutchins, and therefore the, the range of fire is best classified as distant. And, and just to be clear, when, when you say distant, can you, can you put some, um, some actual measurements to that, uh, perhaps in feet? It's difficult to say, but what we generally say very conservatively is that to get the best idea of the actual distance of the firearm to uh, Ms. Hutchins' body would be to do a um, examination or a um, um, sorry, the word has left me, um, a firearm test where you test the actual firearm with the actual ammunition um, to try to get the, the range of fire. However, generally speaking, uh, in forensic pathology, we can estimate that distance roughly to be about two feet or greater. 
two feet or greater. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, if you look at your monitor, I put up uh, States Exhibit 114. Um, do you recognize these? Yes. And what are they? Um, these are the pants that were received along with Ms. Hutchins' body. And were, were you able to make any findings or determinations on the basis of these pants? There were no defects that were significant. The, the clothing had been uh, partially cut or cut due to resuscitative efforts, um, but there's nothing significant um, from my point of view with regard to the gunshot wound. Great. Thank you. And uh, you've mentioned the gun, gunshot wound, so let's talk about that. How many gunshot wounds were there? There were two. Um, what injuries were you able to observe um, externally? There was a gunshot entrance wound in the right armpit region, and there was a gunshot exit wound on Ms. Hutchins' back just below the left scapula or the left shoulder blade area. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move for admission of State's Exhibits 115, 116, and 117. Um, these have also been stipulated to by Defense Counsel. All right, admitted. And you may I publish those? Yes. Dr. Gerald, what are we looking at here? This is a photograph before Ms. Hutchins' body was cleaned, uh, which I typically do with regard to gunshot wounds. And the reason why I do this is because things like soot can wipe off. And so I like to take photographs before the wound is clean that demonstrates that there is no soot surrounding the entrance wound. But what is depicted in this photograph is a gunshot entrance wound in the right armpit region surrounding the entrance wound um, is an abrasion or a scratch um, that is likely due to the positioning of Ms. Hutchins' arm when she was um, when she was shot. And so that's just an abrasion that was caused by the, by the projectile as it entered the armpit area. Thank you. And you also mentioned um, an exit wound. Uh, can you explain what this photograph is? Yes, this is the gunshot exit wound, uh, which was left of the midline, left of Ms. Hutchins' midline on her back below the, um, below the left shoulder blade. Um, it does show, and this is again before it has been cleaned, um, which again is a standard practice, but this is the exit wound. It has some bruising around the exit wound that was probably caused by um, medical intervention and, and placement of of a plastic um, um, device to help render medical aid. Thank you. I'm going to pull up uh, State's Exhibit 117, and this may uh, help help you explain. I know you tried to explain where the exit wound was in terms of her back, so this may uh, give the jury a little bit better idea of where that was. Um, the, just, but just to be clear, this is the same exit wound as from the previous picture, correct? Yes. And do you notice anything uh, different or remarkable in this picture that you didn't already discuss in the previous one? No, it just gives a better orientation. Great, thank you.
Um, Dr. Gerald, based um, on the examination and your review of the photographs, were you able to track the path of the projectile from where it entered Ms. Hutchins' chest and, and where it exited? Yes. And can you explain that path? Yes, the projectile entered through the right armpit area. It missed the major blood vessels in the, in the shoulder area and in the arm. It entered the right aspect of the chest into the right chest cavity. It injured some of the blood vessels that travel along the ribs, broke um, some ribs, or broke one rib, went into the right lung, and exited the left, excuse me, the right chest cavity, just adjacent to the vertebral column. It went through the spinal cord and traveled through the soft tissue of the back before exiting. And as part of that examination, did you use what's called a trajectory rod? Yes. And, and what does that help you do? The trajectory rod um, just simply shows the pathway, the general pathway that the projectile took through the body uh, from the point of entrance to the point of exit. And that trajectory with respect to Ms. Hutchins' body is front to back, right to left, and downward. And were the injuries that Ms. Hutchins suffered to her internal organs consistent with being shot? Yes. Um, and of the, uh, of the injuries that you described, which of those can be lethal? There was documented in medical record, there was over one liter of blood present in the right chest cavity when Ms. Hutchins arrived to UNMH or the University of New Mexico Hospital. And so that indicates significant blood loss within the chest cavity and the injury to the right lung was also lethal. Thank you. And uh, I know you mentioned uh, earlier that you took sam tissue samples for toxicology testing, is that correct? Yes. And what were the results of those toxicology tests? The toxicology was negative for alcohol and common drugs of abuse. Okay. Nothing further? Thank you, Anna. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Doctor, I first want to ask you about your classification. Now, you've been doing autopsies, and you said, I think, 3,000 or 3,500? Yes, 3,500. 3,500. How long, how many years have you done autopsies? I came to the OMI straight out of fellowship in August of 2014. Okay, so 10 years. Yes. And you are very familiar with the classification system, whether it be a homicide or accident, correct? Yes. And in this case, you ruled the cause and manner of death to be accident. Yes. And in a homicide, your definition you gave was a, to rule it a homicide, it has to be a volitional act caused by another to cause death, correct? Yes. And volitional means purposeful? No. What does volitional mean? Volitional just mean well, volitional means a voluntary act. It doesn't mean that there is in it. It doesn't always mean there's intent. You don't need intent. So something as simple as pulling a trigger could be the volitional act. Okay, but in this case, you reviewed reports and you got information, and based on that, your determination was that this was an accident. Yes. And when you uh, said accident, I think you described that as what must not be present is intent to cause death. There should no be. There should not be intent to cause fear, harm, or death. Okay. That's correct. So, in in the materials you read and the information you reviewed, you did not find an intent to cause death by by anybody. That's correct. Okay. And with regard to that classification, that is an official um, state of New Mexico ruling, correct? Yes. Okay. And that is an accident. Yes. Okay. I know in your notes that you documented the approximate time of the incident was about 1348. Is that correct? Yes. And that is 148? Yes. Okay. And then you documented that Ms. Hutchins arrived at the hospital approximately 1520. Is that right? Yes. And that is 320? Yes. Now, that is approximately an hour and a half delay. Is that right? Yes. 
and you knew that she was being attended to by EMT personnel and there was a helicopter waiting to take her to the hospital, is that right? Yes. And do you have any idea why there was a delay in the hospital taking her? No. Okay. Now, during your findings, you did a CT scan before your external examination, correct? Yes. Did you find evidence of prior medical intervention from Ms. Hutchins? Yes. And what was that evidence of medical intervention? Uh, she um, had been intubated. Uh, the intubation was actually in the wrong place. It was in the esophagus. It was removed when she arrived at the hospital, but she was also re-intubated into her esophagus and so not into the airway. Um, she had also had surgical intervention, so they had opened up the chest cavities on both sides due to the presence of a gunshot wound. They had also opened up the protective covering surrounding the heart to try to do what they call uh, manual cardiac massage to restart the heart. Um, it's my understanding that she was pulseless upon arrival and non-responsive and not breathing. You said that she had a, an intubation and another intubation, is that right? Yes. And they were both in the esophagus? Yes. Now, an esophageal intubation can be a dangerous situation, correct? Uh, it's, it's an ineffective um, way to respirate someone or to establish air. And in fact, can, can that potentially cause um, an anoxic situation, a lack of oxygen to the brain? Well, the injury itself is what causes the anoxic situation, but the intubation into the esophagus isn't, um, isn't giving adequate airway establishment. Because, um, doctor, uh, when you do the intubation, you're trying to get it into the bronchus, correct? Yes. And the bronchus, uh, can you tell the jury what the bronchus is? The, the bronchus, the main stem bronchus is the main airway that goes to both lungs. It eventually divides into a left and right bronchus and it goes to each lung. And so by putting it in the esophagus, that is basically sending uh, oxygen into the stomach. Yes. And um, part of your notes, I know you indicated that Ms. Hutchins was complaining of shortness of breath. Yes. And so an intubation into her esophagus would not have assisted with that, with helping her to get that oxygen. That's correct. Um, did you also find in your CT examination that there was a chest needle that was tried to put in? They, attempt to, they attempted to put in a central line, um, which means you're trying to get fluid to, in the, in the most effective way possible. Um, because of her situation, they had to put blood products directly into her heart. And did that, based on your review of that CT exam, it looked like it did not go in properly? Uh, no, it was in the it was in the heart. Oh, it was. They, I, I believe it was. Okay, um, so that wasn't a shallow insertion. Um, I well, I couldn't tell that based on the autopsy or the CT. Okay, so the esophageal intubation. Do you know who performed that? Do you know who did that? I do not. The C CPR efforts you observed, do you know who performed those? Um, not off the top of my head, no. I would have to review the medical records. Based on everything that you saw and as a medical doctor, had this not taken an hour and a half, had Ms. Hutchins received more timely medical intervention, could she have possibly survived these wounds? That's difficult for me to answer that question um, because I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor who treats gunshot wounds in the chest. Um, and I have a very skewed view regarding the lethality of gunshot wounds, so that's outside my purview. When you were interviewed, didn't you say she possibly could have survived? Potentially, but I'm not the best person to ask for that question because I don't treat patients. Okay, but you previously had said that. You acknowledged yes. that. Okay. Thank you, Honor. I have nothing further. Council Clerk, real quick.
Dr. Jarrell, what was your determination as to the cause of death of Helena Hutchins? Her death was caused by a gunshot wound of the chest. Thank you. And um, you said that you performed this autopsy on October 22nd, is that correct? Yes. And her date of death was October 21st, is that correct? Yes. So you had approximately one day's worth of investigative materials available for you to review, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. You're excused. Uh, by court order, the uh, photographer is not allowed to uh, publish any of the OMI pictures. Those uh, that doesn't. Those are the autopsy photos, the three exhibits of the autopsy, and that's um, the order is either direct or or picking up it indirectly. All right, next witness. Uh, the state calls Stephen Orr. Do you, swear, do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Okay. I'm not going to show the photo immediately, but we're going to need to put it up there shortly. Sir, go ahead and uh, state your name for the record. My name is Stephen Orr. How are you currently employed? I'm with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. And what position do you hold at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? I'm currently assigned to the Civil Division. Uh, how long have you been employed there? In the Civil Division or with the Sheriff's Office? With the Sheriff's Office. Uh, just over 15 years. And do you have law enforcement experience prior to going to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? Yes, I'm retired from the Albuquerque Police Department. How long were you with the Albuquerque Police Department? Uh, from 1990 to 2004. And did you become involved in this case somehow? Yes. How did you become involved in this case? On uh, October 28th of uh, 2021 at about 3.01 p.m., um, Sergeant Chris, I, for whatever reason I was at the office, I don't recall the reason why I was at the office that day, um, but Sergeant uh, Chris Zook found me in the office. Uh, he knows uh, my firearms background and uh, asked me to take a look at a rifle that they were having trouble clearing. What are you, what, what's your firearms background? Uh, I became a firearms instructor in 1991. Um, currently a master firearms instructor in, in law enforcement um, with handgun, rifle, uh, patrol rifle, and shotgun. Um, I'm a master uh, hunter education instructor. I became a, a hunter, edu hunter education instructor in uh, 2000, currently a master instructor um, for hunter education. I'm an armor in Glock pistol, um, AR-15 platform rifle, bolt action rifle, and police shotgun. You know a little bit about guns. A little bit. Um, on October, well, no, I think it was Maybe October 27th. On October 27th, uh, were you asked to assist with this case? Um, I, well, I thought it was the 28th, but it maybe, could, could maybe, have been the 27th. But it I, might have been the 28th that you got involved. That I got involved, yes, because uh, um, at the, the scene of this incident, I was not involved. I just, once again, happened to be at the office that day. Um, and Sergeant Zick, knowing my background, just simply asked for some assistance. Okay, I'm going to show you what has been previously entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 10. Can you do your 10 step process? Okay. I, I'm not seeing it on the other monitors. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's already been entered in, in evidence, so I think we can publish it. Let's go ahead and do that. Do you recognize that? It didn't come up, but I, it flashed for a moment before, but you, yes. You don't have it in front of you? No, ma'am.
10? Yeah, I do not. I do not, yes. Okay, yes, I, yes, ma'am. Do you recognize that? I do. Um, where did that come from, and how did, how did you end up uh, in possession of it? Uh, once again, I was I was at the office. I don't recall the reason for the third time. I don't recall the reason why I was at the office that day. Um, Sergeant Zook, who was the, at the time the sergeant of the Criminal Investigation Division, asked me to take a look at this rifle. Apparently, it, uh, there was, there were some cartridges that were stuck in the gun, and uh, he didn't know how to clear it, so he asked me to clear it for him. So, what I, to answer your question, what I'm looking at here is a Henry Patton Allen Arms uh, 4440 lever action rifle. So let me ask you, um, was the gun jammed? It was jammed, yes. Why was the gun jammed? Well, first of all, let me explain the difference between a, a jam and a malfunction. Okay, a, mal a malfunction is something that can be readily cleared by, by the operator of the firearm. A jam is something that's going to take uh, an armor or possibly even a gunsmith to, to take it apart. What happened with this particular firearm here, there was a, uh, a cartridge of the wrong size, the wrong diameter, um, entered into the, uh, the tubular magazine of the gun. And as Sergeant Zook was trying to uh, uh, eject the rounds, probably by, I'm only guessing because I wasn't there, um, by moving the lever action back and forth to uh, eject the rounds from the gun, uh, the round of the wrong caliber wouldn't chamber into, uh, into the firearm, so then it couldn't be ejected. So did the gun jam because Sergeant Zook was manipulating the lever action or did it jam because there was a wrong caliber bullet in there or cartridge rather? Well, the cartridge wouldn't properly chamber. So since it couldn't properly chamber, it couldn't properly eject. So that's what caused the jam. So can you explain to the jurors um, how that gun would have been able to receive um, a, a cartridge of the wrong caliber to begin with. Yes. Um, do they have a picture of this gun in front of them? They do. Okay. Um, and your monitor has arrows and all kinds of stuff. I'm not, I'm not an expert at using that, but. Okay. This right here, um, you'll see. I don't know how to yeah, use the uh, the arrow here. Okay. Okay. There's a lever right here that you can see, and you move this lever forward, all right, to the front Judge, portion. Can you approach? Yes. Proceed, sir. Okay, the way this gun is loaded, all right, there you can see right here this little little tab. Okay, it's held back by spring tension. You overcome spring tension by moving it forward, and the front of this gun here has about the oh, last three or four inches will rotate sideways, opening up what's called a tubular magazine. All right, um, for la a tubular magazine, for lack of a better term, is like a fat metal straw. Okay, and the, the cartridges can be dropped down into that tubular magazine. Now, the diameter of the magazine tube is wide enough to accommodate slightly larger than caliber ammunition, and that is what happened in this case. Once the, uh, the tubular magazine is loaded, then the fore, end, uh, or the fore portion of the, of the uh, muzzle is closed up, and the, the rifle can be cycled by lever action. And what you have down here is the lever action, which um, basically is the action of the gun, hence the name lever action. So the 45 caliber cartridge was fit in that, did you call it a loading tube or? It's a, a tubular magazine. Tubular magazine. Uh, but the 45, because it was the wrong caliber, was 
was too large to cycle through. Correct. Okay. Um, and were you brought in to fix this gun and make it safe? Yes. And were you able to do that? Yes. Um, are, how can this gun be unloaded once cartridges are put in the tubular magazine? Well, there are two ways to unload this gun. Okay, the first one is what I'm guessing that Sergeant Zook did, okay, and all he did was this lever action right here that I, that I uh, have uh, pointed to. Okay, you work it back and forth in a lever action type motion, all right? And I can go through the mechanics of the gun, but the simple answer is through mechanical uh, linkage, the cartridge is removed from the tubular magazine, entered into the chamber, um, and then the extractor will pull the, the uh, round out of the chamber and kick it out of the gun. So depending on the number of rounds you have in the tubular magazine, if you have five rounds, in theory, you run the action five times and all five rounds will, will kick out of the gun, will be ejected from the gun. The other way to, to unload this gun, and the way I ended up unloading this gun, is once again, I showed you this little lever right here, pulled it forward, the front barrel of the gun will rotate to the side and exposing the top part of this metal, metal fat straw that I, that I explained to you. All right, you turn the gun upside down, for lack of a better term, and, and gravity is your friend, the rounds fall out. Thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. Cross exam. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, so the the round that was actually in this gun, um, do you know if this was actually a dummy round that was inside? I don't know. Uh, would there be any danger if it was a dummy round that was inside? Um, if it were a, there was a well, if you describe the two differences between a dummy round and say a um, a blank. Okay, but you didn't know one way or the other. I did not. It know. could have been a dummy round that was. Could have been a dummy round. Yes. Um, and it sounds like uh, Zook didn't properly unload this gun. Would you agree with that? I have no idea because when, uh, I don't know what uh, happened to the gun prior to me putting my hands on it. Um, and I can only describe the configuration the gun is when I got it. What happened with Sergeant Zook prior to, to me taking possession of the gun for that brief period of time, I can't tell you. I just don't know. Well, Zook came to you because he couldn't figure out it himself, right? Yes. So, so he wasn't properly unloading it. Agree? I think he was trying, but I, but I would agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was trying, he couldn't do it, um, but isn't this rifle, the way you just described this to the jury, it's pretty easy to unload, isn't it? Um, if you're familiar with the firearm, sure. I mean, any, anything's easy if you know about it, um, to, and you don't know until you do. So you just open the rifle and the rounds fall out the bottom, right? Um, well, they fall out the front. Or, or they fall out of it yeah. once you open it, right? Yes. Um, and, and you said your involvement in this case was, or in that limited role, was because nobody really knew how to take this gun apart, right? Correct. And you told us that in a pretrial interview as well, right? Correct. Now, you don't know who loaded that rifle with that round? I do not. Cleared, do you? And you didn't interview any of the multiple people in this case who reportedly loaded firearms? I did not. No further questions. Redirect. So, hypothetically, if Sergeant Zook attempted to unload the gun by manipulating the lever action, as you demonstrated, is that an incorrect way of unloading the gun? No, it's not. It that's, that, that's a perfectly legitimate way of unloading that gun, correct? Yes, until the... the uh the incorrect round was attempted to be loaded into the chamber. Uh, up to that point, yes, that was a correct way of unloading the gun. Okay. Nothing further, thank you. All right, thank you, you're excused. Thank Next you. witness. Uh, State Hall's Byron French.
Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Good morning, sir. Go ahead and state your name for the record. Good morning. My name is Byron French. How are you currently employed? I am employed by the Rio Rancho Police Department, but I am signed to the FBI's New Mexico Regional Computer Forensics Lab as a task force officer. So are you a sworn law enforcement officer? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you give us some indication of your background and training uh, with regard to cellular phone extractions? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll start when I, I first became a law enforcement officer. I graduated the academy in January of 2011 uh, from the New Mexico Law Enforcement Academy here in Santa Fe. Uh, the first four years I was on patrol and then the opportunity arose to become a digital forensic examiner at the New Mexico Regional Computer Forensics Laboratory. Uh, I, I got assigned that position and it's a, it's a two-year certification process approximately. Every examiner starts out working Windows computers, doing win, uh, forensics, digital forensics on Windows computers. And um, there is the opportunity from there to do digital forensics with cell phones as well. Um, during, that, during the initial process, uh, there's, there's just the pipelines of training and then I went through what's called the basic cell phone course with the FBI in Huntsville, Alabama back in I want to say 2017, July of 2017. Uh, from there, I've taken a couple of other different specialty classes when it comes to digital forensics and cell phones. Black Bag offers a uh, Macintosh forensics class, and part of Macintosh is the Apple um, operating system. Uh, from there, I've taken another handful of other courses such as uh, Celebrate. They offer what's called CCO, CCPA, and they are a forensic tool. And what CCO stands for is Celebrate Certified Operator. That is just one portion of the course and it familiarizes you with the best practices to extract data off of mobile devices. The second part of that is CCPA. It is Celebrate Certified Physical Analyst. And that teaches um, you best practices and how to actually go through the data that has been extracted. From there, I have taken uh, other courses such as um, a basic cell phone repair class. Uh, sometimes we get these phones in as evidence and they are destroyed. I have the ability to repair them. I have been through advanced training um, ISP and uh, JTAG and ISP, I'm sorry, ISP and chip off. ISP stands for in-system programming and chip off is, is just like it sounds. You, you take the chip off the device. Um, I've also taken what's called SANS 585 advanced cell phone forensics. And uh, just recently, I've been invited out to become a instructor for Celebrate themselves to instruct that those courses. How did you become involved in this case, if you recall? I believe it was back in uh, 2019. Um, was it 2019 or 2020? I'm sorry. I'm 2021. Having... 2021. Sorry, not enough coffee this morning. Uh, back in 2021. I was contacted by Detective Alex Hancock from the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office to assist with phone extractions. And did you perform a phone extraction um, on the cell phone belonging to Hannah Gutierrez? I did. And did you... Um, Tell us a little bit about the the, uh, the extraction that you did, and and what are you um, extracting? Are you extracting text messages, photos, everything? Give the jurors an idea of what's going on. Sure. So um, in this instance, I did use the Celebrate program to perform an extraction, and there was two extractions involved. One is called a logical, and the other one is a file system, and. Generally, um, with those two extractions, you try and extract. Council, can you approach? Yes. yes.
Sorry for the interruption, sir. That's okay. Um, Pursuant to uh, defense counsel stipulation, uh, will the court recognize Mr. French as an expert in what, what areas are you usually qualified in? Digital forensics. Thank you. Yes, digital forensic examinations. You're an expert. Thank you. Have you been qualified as an expert in that area previously? Yes, ma'am, I have. How many times? Uh, twice. Once in the Honorable Martha Vasquez um, courtroom not too far from here, and then the other in the Honorable Judge Johnson in Albuquerque, both United States District Courts. Federal Courts. Federal Courts. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at my request, uh, did you uh, review a particular photo? I did. And pursuant to Defense Counsel's stipulation, I would like to enter into evidence and publish State's Exhibit 118. Admitted and you may publish. Okay. He's got it. Do you see that photograph on your screen? I do, ma'am. Um, is this a photograph that was on Ms. Gutierrez's cell phone? Yes, it was. And can you uh, tell the jurors the day and time that this was taken? Uh, without looking exactly at the EXIF data, um, do we have a picture of that by chance or? I probably do. That would help. I wouldn't want to put it up on that screen. Uh, do you, let, let me ask you this. Do you remember the date that it was taken? If memory serves correctly, I want to say it was around December 21st. And that might not be correct, because I was, right. okay. All right, sir. Um, let's, uh, let's take a, let's I think the year could inform the jury. You just said December 21st. That, but that, it, that's not the correct date, so. Oh. I've looked at the exit data, <laughs> uh, so I know the correct date. So let, let's just take it. Get, give us just a moment here to to clear this up. So I need to disconnect. All right, we're going to take our morning break. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. And we'll be back about, uh, what is that, uh, 10 to 10. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, you may be seated. We're in recess. See you back here then.
right, you may be seated. Let's continue. All right. Thank you, Mr. French. Um, can you please tell the jurors the date that that photo was taken? Yes, October 10th, 2021 at 9.50 in the morning. Thank you. Elmo, please. Um, the state is going to move for uh, the admission of state's exhibits 119 through 129. I don't believe there's an objection. No, no. Okay. Sorry. Right. States 119, 129 through 129 are admitted without objection. You may publish. All right. Thank you. Um, sir, prior to your testimony, did I send you some text messages? You did. Uh, are those text messages from the extraction that you performed? Yes, ma'am. On Ms. Gutierrez's phone? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm going to show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 19. Let's see if... If you can just give us uh, the date and time uh, and whether or not those messages are incoming or outgoing, who they're going from and who they're going to. Uh, sure. So both of these messages appear to be outgoing from the uh, what's identified as the owner of the device, Hannah Reed, to a contact named Becca Santa Fe. The first message has the timestamp at the bottom right of October 23rd, 2021, 1228 p.m., and it says, hey, comma, I might be coming to Albuquerque tonight and was wondering if I can get that stuff. Uh, the next message has a timestamp of October 23rd, 2021 at 5.09 p.m. And it says, Becca, call me when you get a chance. And states exhibit 120. Can you see that or is it too small? I believe I can see it. Can you guys see it? Can, I, can the jurors see it? Yeah. You bet. We'll zoom in and we'll just move it around a little bit. So the first message is an outgoing uh, from the same contact, Hannah Reed owner, to Courtney Santa Fe. Uh, the message states, he gets in in 30 mins or so Becca hasn't texted me back at all, and I'm trying to get my things from her tomorrow. This message was sent at uh, on October 23rd, 2021 at 6.20 p.m. The next message is from Courtney Santa Fe to Hannah Reed, the owner of the device, and it just says OK, uh, with the timestamp of October 23rd, 2021 at 6.24 p.m. The next one is from Hannah Reed to Courtney Santa Fe. It says, K, know if, excuse me, let me start over. K, let me know if you hear from her at all. Thanks for checking on me again. Miss you already. And that is time stamped October 23rd, 2021 at 625 p.m. So council has asked me to um, let you know that uh, some of this uh, would ordinarily be hearsay but they've agreed to let the um, let the entire um, portion in, and it's for context effect on listener. Okay, thank you. States Exhibit One Twenty One. Uh, another message from Hannah Reed to Courtney Santa Fe. Oh, I'm sorry. We just looked at that one. It was part of the it was part of the previous group. We'll we'll uh, take One Twenty One out. Um, States Exhibit 122. This one, the top message is from Hannah Reed, owner, to Courtney Santa Fe. And the message says, could Becca maybe drop off my things to y'all since I haven't been able to catch her. That is uh, November 13th, 2021 at 7.02 p.m. The next message shown there is from Courtney Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. I asked her to, hopefully she will. 
and that is uh, the same time or the same day, of November thirteenth, two thousand twenty-one, at seven oh six p.m. States Exhibit one twenty-three. The top message is from Hannah Reed, owner, to Becca Santa Fe. Hey, coming to Albuquerque tomorrow. That is time stamped November. It looks like seventh, two thousand twenty-one, at two fifty-two p.m. And the next message is from Hannah Reed, owner, to Becca Santa Fe. Gonna be there for a week or so, November seventh, two thousand twenty-one, at two fifty-two p.m. States Exhibit one twenty-four. The top one is from Becca Santa Fe. Uh, from Becca Santa Fe to Hannah Reed, owner. I'm in Roswell working on. Baron and Toluca, and that is time stamped November 8, 2021, at 9 20 a.m. The next message is from Hannah Reed, owner, to Becca Santa Fe. Ah, oh, is that far? Bummer, I wanted to see you. And that is November 10th, 2021, at 2 39 p.m. States Exhibit 125. This one is from Hannah Reed, owner to Becca Santa Fe, and it says, Hey Becca, mind if my brother-in-law picks up my things from you after Thanksgiving. He lives in Albuquerque. That is time stamped November 22nd, 2021 at 5.53 p.m. States Exhibit 126. I know these are um, a little out of order. We'll, we'll pull them together with another witness in terms of their chronology. Go ahead, sir. Uh, this one is from Hannah Reed, owner, to Courtney Santa Fe. Hey, do you have Becca's number? And that is October 23rd, 2021 at 517 p.m. States Exhibit 128. A message from Hannah Reed, owner, to Becca Santa Fe. Becca, with the question mark, on October 24th, 2021 at 1131 a.m. And for context, 129. Um, this one, the first one, is from Becca Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. And it says, hey, dot, 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 I am in Hamas working on Big Sky Splinter Unit. That is October 24th, 2021 at 11.33 a.m. The next message is from Becca Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. How are you doing, lady? And that is... October 24th, 2021, at 11.34 a.m. Thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. Cross-exam. Good morning, Mr. French. Good morning, ma'am. Um, so, you looked at phones, and I'm going to focus on... Uh, Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls, you looked at those two phones, didn't you? I did. Um, and for Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls, you bookmarked a very limited data that you extracted, right? Yes, ma'am. So you, so you didn't extract all the data on Sarah Zachary's phone, right? I did full extractions on all phones that were given to me, ma'am. And then you bookmarked the limited data and passed that on to Detective Hancock, right? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. And the same for Dave Halls. You, you bookmarked limited data and passed that on to Detective Hancock, right? Yes, ma'am. But it, isn't it true that you don't know the significance of any of the items you bookmarked um, and what they have per, to do pertaining to the shooting event, do you? Can you phrase the question differently, please? Sure. And, and you talked about this a little bit in your pretrial interview. Um, the significance of the items from the phones of Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls. Um, you bookmarked those, but you don't have any information, you don't know the significance of what you bookmarked in relation to the shooting event. I don't know if I would word it as significance. I, I generally do what is requested of me within the request form. Okay, so do you remember giving a pretrial interview in this case, um, November 29th of 2023? I do. Okay, um, and counsel, I'm referring to page 5, lines 19 through... 24. Okay. Um, do you remember being asked 
specifically with respect to the examination of Dave Hall's phones, um, so of these items from his phone, do any of them have any significance to this event, this shooting? And answering, I don't know. I just booked market for the case agent. That way she could make her determination. That's correct. I didn't say that. Okay. So, so then you'd agree with me that the items that you bookmarked um, and gave and passed on um, that we're, we're talking about here today pertaining to, to Dave Halls and Sarah, um, you don't know the significance of those items pertaining to the shooting. Well, ma'am, it is not my job to determine significance. Exactly. I just determine, or I don't even determine, I just find what is asked of me within the request form and I leave it up to the case agent and to continue her investigation with it. Okay, and you, you also don't have any texts between Sarah Zachary and Seth Kinney before October 21st of 2021, right? I do not remember. Okay, do you remember your, your um, uh, did you review your report prior to coming into court to testify? Uh, there was multiple reports for this and unfortunately I can't commit all of them to memory. Okay, so I'm sitting, can you approach? Sure. Okay. Um, so, so sitting here today, um, it, it, is it fair to say you don't remember um, any text messages in your review uh, between Sarah Zachary and Seth Kinney? I don't. Before October 21st of 2021? I don't, ma'am. Okay. Um, and you weren't asked to examine Seth Kinney's phone, were you? I don't believe so. That was not one of the phones that was given to me. And you weren't asked to examine Alec Baldwin's phones, were you? No, ma'am, I was not. Uh, is that unusual to you that in a shooting case, um, not to be looking at the, the shooter's phone right away? Not not always. Okay. Um, but but regardless, the, your, the work you did in this case was limited to what Detective Hancock specifically directed you to do, fair? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, just a moment, Your Honor. Pass the 
redirect. Mr. French, are you aware that Mr. Baldwin submitted his phone for extraction in the state of New York? Yes, I am. Thank you. I have right, nothing further. This witness is excused. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next witness. He calls Luke Hayes. Please don't talk to any other witnesses, sir. And also, as a reminder, no witnesses that have not been called yet should not be on the watch live stream or the reserved ones other than experts. You know, just let's hang on and do it when we're, when we get there. We've got to go through his background. And do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Have a seat talking to the microphone. Uh, Your Honor, pursuant to our uh, agreement with security in terms of firearm safety, uh, uh, Mr. Rice is going to provide Mr. Haig with a box that, are, that has a firearm in it. That has been cleared. Yes. I suspect Mr. Haig will clear it again. It is clear. Sir, can you go ahead and state your full name for the record? Lucian C. Haig, spelled H-A-A-G. How do you spell your first name? L-U-C-I-E-N. How are you currently employed? I have my own consulting firm in Carefree, Arizona, Forensic Science Services. What does Forensic Science Services do? I'm involved in firearms evidence examination, primarily the reconstructive aspects of shootings. Distance determinations, uh, long range shootings, is it a ricocheted bullet? Uh, how close was the gun when it was discharged? Those are all reconstructive issues beyond the usual identifying a bullet or cartridge as having been fired from a gun. That's something I also do, but my main focus is the reconstructive aspects of shootings. What were you asked to do in this case? Well, a number of things. To determine uh, how and, and, the and let me let, let me stop you real quick. Were you asked to do reconstruction or were you asked to do more examination and identification? Identification was a small part of what I did. I did do that with the evidence cartridge case, but primarily reconstruction. On this, in this case? That's correct. Okay. Um, and can you uh, give the jurors an idea of your background and experience, please? Yes, most uh, criminalists, which is my uh, professional title, have a degree in one of the physical sciences. Mine is in chemistry with some minor in physics. Uh, that was obtained in 1963 from the University of California at Berkeley. I then went to California State College at Long Beach, taking two more years of study, which included two semesters of criminalistics. That course was taught by the primary firearms examiner for the city of Los Angeles. Other courses were mathematics, clinical chemistry, documents examination. That takes me to 1965, when I gained employment with the City of Phoenix Police Crime Laboratory as an entry-level criminalist. Um, I was sent on to Arizona State University, local university, for additional coursework. I started attending meetings of professional organizations that deal with firearms evidence because that became my main focus in the crime lab. Although I worked in all sections, I later supervised them. My real interest and passion was the ballistics or firearms unit of the laboratory. I left there 
there being the city of Phoenix Crime Lab in uh, 1982. So I was there about 18 years. I'd been doing some private consulting, some teaching at that time. I was an instructor in criminalistics, which included firearms evidence. Um, I started my own company when I left the city of Phoenix. My company became my full-time employer, and I've been working there ever since. Sir, do you have any professional memberships? Yes, there are a number of them. The, the most important one is an organization called AFTE, A -F -T -E, the Association of Firearm and Toolmark Examiners. Um, I'm a, a long-time member. I became uh, president in 1985 and 86, served on a number of committees. Other organizations include the California Association of Criminalists. That's the nearest regional area. I'm a distinguished member of that organization. I'm a member and fellow in the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, which has a criminalistic section. I'm an associate member in a European organization. Um, that's most of them. Okay. Uh, can you summarize for us your uh, presentations and publications? Yes, I'm very passionate about presenting evidence among our, our peers in the AFTI group. So to date, I've presented, and most of them have been published, about 200 publications over the last 50 years or so. Um, I've authored with my younger son, who you'll probably hear about, a textbook on shooting incident reconstruction, which is now in its third edition, with the unimaginative title, Shooting Incident Reconstruction. Um, uh, have you received any citations or awards? Yes, the AFTI group I mentioned before has voted me Key Member of the Year Award several times, Distinguished Member Status, likewise the California Association of Criminalists, and they have a fairly uncommon award called the Roger Green Award that's for historical work, and I'm very interested in history, especially cases that involve the use or misuse of firearms, so I received that award from the CAC. And um, have you been qualified as an expert in the areas of firearm examination and or reconstruction? Many times. Approximately how many times? Well, over the last uh, well, more than half a century, 57 years, several hundred times, I'm sure. Uh, have you been qualified in both state and federal courts? Yes, I have. Um, have you been qualified in numerous states in the United States? About half of the states in the United States and several foreign countries. What foreign countries? Uh, Northern Ireland, uh, case in Guam, um, I think, and in Canada. Okay. Several times. Um, sir, do you have any particular interest or expertise in uh, single action revolvers or old western style revolvers? Uh, yes, I'm interested in all types of firearms and their mechanisms, but single action guns are of course what we see in, in western movies. Um, they're fairly straightforward, they're historic. Sam Colt is a well-known name, um, and he was an inventive genius, and his firearms uh, to this day are still prized as collector item if you are so lucky as to have an original. Um, and how did you become involved in this case? I think it started with a phone call in March of last year where the, I was well aware of the case. I'd heard about it. I didn't know much about it other than there had been some sort of a misadventure on a set with a death and an injury. So after that documents uh, were received. That's where I start every case. I want to read what's known about the case, what the issues are. Uh, interviews were sent to me, um, a lot of photographs, and ultimately uh, in July of last year I went to the local property room with the custodian there and along with my younger son Mike. Uh, we received well I think an inventory over 50 some items, but some of these had sub items in them. So that was that was the beginning. Um, as a part of the document review that you did in this case, did you review uh, the ballistics report and the case notes from the FBI? Yes, I did. Okay, so um, expert. 
Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, is there any objection to tendering Mr. I'll ask the court to, to uh, accept Mr. Haig as an expert in uh, firearms examination and reconstruction. All right, no objection. Yes, he's such an expert. Thank you. Um, sir, in it, so, so in addition to reviewing the FBI uh, examination report and the case notes, uh, you also took numerous items of evidence into your own possession and performed testing on those uh, on those items. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, was the uh, evidence revolver in this case that I'll refer to as the Baldwin revolver was that was that one of the items that you that that you took into your possession and tested? Yes, it was. Um, let's start with the FBI report. Let's go ahead and give me a screen. Mr. Bowles, is Mr. Higg your witness? Yes. Do you, do you want to look at these real quick? I'm going to um, move for the admission of state's exhibits 130 through 146 uh, and permission to publish with the witness as we move through his testimony. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. All right, states 130 through 146 um, are admitted and you may publish. Uh, sir, so we have on your screen States Exhibit 130, but, but before we speak directly um, to this, can ultimately, did you form an opinion, and I know we haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to, did you form an opinion about uh, how the damage to this firearm occurred? Yes, I did. And did you also form an opinion uh, as to the working condition of the firearm when it was received by the FBI? I did. Let's start there. Uh, what was your opinion with regard to the working condition of this firearm when it was initially received by the FBI? By various means, I could see that it was in proper working order as designed by the original uh, inventor. And tell us what you took into consideration in coming to that opinion. Well, there are several ways. One of them is on my screen. I don't know if it's on your screen or not. But it's from the FBI examiner's report, a man named Bruce uh, Ziegler, I believe. Who I Bryce. Met. Bryce, yeah. But I looked at all of his photographs and notes. And on the left side are the four positions that the hammer can have with this gun when it's working properly and undamaged. The top one shows the hammer fully forward and down. That's the way it would appear if you had just fired it or even dry fired it. The next picture down looks pretty much the same, but it's not. The hammer is about an eighth of an inch rearward, uh, and now it has engaged an internal mechanism, a safety notch. So now the hammer and firing pin cannot reach a fire a live cartridge, I'm sorry, a live cartridge. The third picture down is the loading position, also known as half cock. The previous position could be called, and it's often called, quarter cock. At that half cock position, the third picture down, the cylinder, which holds six, capable of holding six cartridges, is now free to rotate. Prior to this, in the upper two pictures, it was locked and secured by a small latch that we can't see in these pictures. The final picture 
and it's the most important one, the hammer is at the full cock, ready to fire position. You can now see the firing pin in the hammer, that it's fully rearward, and it's staying there. That will be important uh, uh, later. And, and if you would, um, because it, describe for us what the firearm is that you have in front of you. Is that this exact gun? It's the brother to the evidence gun. Same make, model, caliber. Uh, it's just not the evidence gun. And um, would you demonstrate for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, the the different positions and also uh, specifically the half cock position and the rotation of the cylinder? Sure. Well, I checked it, but again, just so everyone feels as comfortable as they're going to be around a firearm. Hang on just a second. You should probably stand in the middle. Yeah, do you want to stand? Okay. And, and sure. That would be great. I'm left hand dominant, so I have to explain that. The hammer is fully down. If there were a live cartridge in this gun, the firing pin would be resting right against it. So this is an unsafe carry position if it were a loaded gun. It would also be the position if I had just fired it. There would be a spent cartridge, the firing pin would be deep into the primer of that cartridge. You can also see if the trigger is back. Now when I pull it there, that's the safety position. Very little movement, but the hammer is now about an eighth of an inch rearward. Triggers just pop forward, so it's got an internal spring that is resetting. Cylinder is still locked up, cannot rotate. Now when I pull it to the load position, you may have seen the cylinder rotate already. It's free to rotate now. The little latch that I mentioned, which we can't see, has been pulled down by that motion. There's a loading gate here on the side that's opened, and this is where I would either remove fired cartridges or place live cartridges up to a total of six. After loading it, fully loading it, I close that gate. And I have two choices. If I'm ready to shoot, I'm going to cock it. And if I've decided what I'm going to shoot at is to be shot at, pull the trigger. Hammer falls off of a ledge, a little notch. Actually, it's more of a step on the hammer. So now we're back to where we were a moment ago. If I'm going to fire it again, Pull it all the way back. Hammer stays in position, which we saw in the photographs, which again is important because when we get to the damage that occurred with the gun, hammer won't stay there. If I'm going to let it down, if I'm going to render this gun safe, I decide I'm not going to shoot. I do have to pull the trigger, but I get my thumb firmly on this spur. Pull the trigger, let it down. Once I get past the halfway point, I can let go of the trigger and it engages the safety notch again. So there's all the steps. It's called a single action. You've probably heard that term a couple of times because pulling the trigger accomplishes one single thing. It fires the gun. Um, in, in terms of... Sorry. In terms of that loading gate uh, and the, the loading of the gun, um, if you were to... Show me the primers and the head stamps uh, of the of the rounds that you have in the gun. We know that there are none, but this is we're just going to play pretend. Uh, show me how you would show me what's in that gun. Well, I bring it up. No one downrange. Here, maybe we go this way so that I bring the hammer of half cock. Okay, we want to show the jury. Let's go over here. Let's so they can they can see oh, the behind okay. us. There we go. The, she used the term, it's an industry term, the head stamp. It's what's written on the cartridge, and in the middle of which is a primer. So if she wanted to see, or any of you wanted to see, are there fired cartridges in here, live cartridges, all six? I just rotate the cylinder. And we go a couple of times around, see if there are any empty chambers, or fired cartridges, or live rounds. If we wanted to take them out, if they're live, you just dump them out. If they're fired, you need this ejection rod here to knock a spent cartridge out because it's expanding. 
So if you were to show me the rounds that you have in the gun uh, in this manner, I can only see the head stamp and primer of one cartridge at a time. That's right. In, in this view from behind the gun with the gate open. Okay. Thank you, sir. Can you take seat. my seat? Yes. So, when you, oh, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you can think of uh, from the documents that you reviewed uh, that, uh, that, that went into, that contributed to your opinion that the gun was in uh, proper working order when it was received at the FBI? Uh, yes, the examiner was able to fire at least 12 live cartridges for comparison purposes uh, to recover bullets and fired cartridge cases. Uh, the gun had to be in working order to do that. Had it been in the condition I later found it, uh, you wouldn't have been able to do that. And the condition that you later found it, can you just kind of describe um, what what was wrong with it when you took it into evidence? And I'm going to pull a, a, an aid up. This is going to be an exhibit that's already entered into evidence, Exhibit 97A. It had been dis di partially disassembled. It was in a gun box with some ties. I'm working on it. <laughs> Hang on. Um, Pardon me, where's my... Okay, uh, if you can use this as an aid and, and sir, your screen, uh, you, you can you know, use it to draw lines and okay. all kinds of stuff. So it's a touch screen. It is, if, yeah. if you need some assistance. This is one of the FBI, of the many FBI pictures, and you're looking at three parts of the gun. The obvious one's the hammer. He's going to show you how to mark it and uh, get rid of it. How do I erase it? Okay. The hammer's pretty obvious. Here's the firing pin. I really wanted to make a circle. It's making arrows. Can it? <laughs> you tricked me. We're looking at the hammer, and I'm really pressing hard. <laughs> the hammer, the important part of the hammer are these notches you can see here. There's two clear notches, something goes in them. Well, one of them is the safety position. The next one is the load position. The one that's very difficult to see, and I almost obliterated it, is down at the bottom of my circle. That's the that's where the full cock step would be, but it's been uh, peened, P-E-E-N-E-D. It's been uh, knocked off, rolled, rounded off, and it's full of very rough tool marks. The piece that would fit into each one of those is the trigger, and the trigger is the black piece here, but the tip of the trigger in the industry is called the sear, S-E-A-R, that's the piece that goes in those three locations. And it really sets, it rests on this step when it's in the full cock position. So that's somewhat tenuous and the pulling of the trigger causes it to slide off the hammer to fall. There's a little piece in that circle I just drew. That's the broken off sear 
of the trigger. So it's an incomplete trigger. And finally, the object up here has two names. The, industry, the company that makes this reproduction gun calls it the Bolt, B-O-L-T. Uh, I've always called it a cylinder stop latch. It was the thing that was securing the cylinder in the safety position, uh, in the uh, full cock position, but not in the loading position. That The left side of that goes up into the notches in the cylinder for those previous positions and drops down and allows the cylinder to rotate in the load position. So looking at those both photographically and in person, I could see that the full cock step or notch on the hammer was broken away, beaten away, or knocked away. Uh, kind of hard to describe it if you don't see it under the microscope. And the sear was broken off. And the stop latch, uh, the little wings, there's two pieces that protrude out. Uh, that also was broken. And the gun can't work in the normal fashion if it had been that way on the movie set. And based on your document review, do you have an opinion about how uh, the the bolt, the trigger sear, and the hammer were damaged. What, what took place that caused that damage? The hammer had to be in the full cock position and one or more substantial blows, impacts to the hammer. Because it's just sitting, the, the, the sear and the trigger and the full cock notch are just sitting there engaged with each other and it's a small area. So if you give a substantial blow one or more to the back of the hammer, it is stressing that area and it will finally, and did, finally fail. And I can see under the microscope a lot of very rough tool marks where it's just rolled over and rounded off. It's no longer a step. It's a rounded area which cannot retain the trigger even if it was intact. What's your understanding of, of the circumstances of the blows you're talking about? As I understood reading the examiner's notes and report, it was an evaluation of whether this gun uh, was prone to accidental discharge by an impact to the hammer. Okay, we're going to uh, look at a, a few other photos here. But before I take this photo down, I'm going to pause. Yeah. Council Press. Um, Mr. Haig, let's, uh, let, let's shift gears for just a moment. In, in, based on everything that you reviewed and also the, the, the uh, examination and the firing of this gun uh, that you yourself participated in, have you seen any evidence that the full cock hammer notch was filed or modified to allow faster shooting? No. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm showing you what has been marked as States Exhibit 134. Can you explain uh, to the jury what we're looking at here? Yes, you're looking at two triggers from a Colt reproduction single action revolver. The lower one is from probably the very pistol that's here today. It was a new Pieta Colt single action that uh, my younger son owns. So that's the way it should look. The one above 
is the broken damage trigger and the tip of the sear is not even present in this picture. So that area that's missing, just trying to get the hang of this, it's right there. Okay, um, and I'm gonna show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 137. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, this is a view through an instrument called a stereo microscope uh, to which a camera's been attached and you're looking at a putting back together, so to speak, like a broken teacup where I'm putting the two parts together and all that roughness you see there are manufacturing marks. Those aren't breakage marks, but just when they made the part on the one side of it, it's been machined and under the microscope you can see those lines. So if you look at that, you can sort of see the contour agrees and if we put them, my son and I put them right back together, you just see a faint line. So. We deliberately pulled them apart a little bit so you can see they're two pieces, not just a crack in a piece. So just to be clear, what we're looking at here in States Exhibit 137 is the trigger with the top part of the or part of the sear and then the and then the part of the sear that was broken off. Is that right? Yes, two pictures back. If you remember there was a little piece of metal off to one side and the trigger with a piece missing, that's what you're looking at here. Those have been put back together, uh, are, are brought close together under the microscope. And this is just a demonstration that the piece of the sear that broke off fits back on to, to, to the trigger sear mechanism, uh, sort of like pieces of a puzzle. Yes, Okay. but it's not ground off or rounded off, it's snapped off, it's broken off. States Exhibit 138, can you tell us what we're looking at here? Again, you're looking through the microscope at the evidence hammer as I saw it, and this area, try to do this a little better, that's where there should be a nice right angle step, and there isn't. It's just rounded off toward the right. The other two are the load notch, and they truly are notches, and the quarter cock or safety notch. But the circled area should not look like that. There's no step there at this point. And it's your opinion that that uh, was shaved off during the aggressive testing at the FBI? Yes. States Exhibit 139, can you tell us what we've got here? Council, may I ask, were these introduced? Were they admitted? Yes. Earlier? I believe so. I, I asked to admit um, oh, 130 through 146. Okay, thank you. Got it. Okay. Go ahead, sir. You're looking at four hammers in sort of an oblique view. Three of them my younger son and I provided. I bought two. He took one out of the revolver you saw here today. But the one here is the evidence hammer. And if you look across at the other three, you can see that they're, they're visually quite different. And again, the evidence hammer has very little left for the sear of even an unbroken trigger to rest on. So that was the purpose, to just to show what do these things look like and does the manufacturer make them in a reproducible way? And of course, they do. Okay, thank you. States Exhibit 135. Yes, this is the, again, company calls it the bolt. Um, I know it as the cylinder stop latch. You, as a user, would only see that part. It comes up and down inside the frame of the gun to lock the cylinder up or to release it. The rest of it's well within the gun and it's being operated when you uh, pull the hammer back and it's broken. One of the little ears or tabs um, is broken off. Can you hold up your um, exemplar revolver and just show the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the, the, the area of that bolt that you have circled? Can you just show the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the notches on the cylinder where that engages? Sure. It, you might be able to see the notches here. They come around. That's where the, the latch goes in. You can't see the latch unless we disassemble the gun. If 
you were to have this in the jury room and you were to look through here, there's a little bit of daylight, I can see it pop up and I can hear it go into the battery, so to speak. But otherwise you will not see it. You just know if it's working or not. And show me, I'm sorry, can you show me the notches on the cylinder where... Sure. Let's bring it to the load position. Glad, let's, let, let's walk around so that they can see it just a little bit better, especially since the, it's a dark metal, it's hard to see. I'll just walk down the line. My finger's right at one of them. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I'm going to shift gears real quick because then we're going to have to move to another machine. Um, the Were you also asked to examine some uh, ammunition in this case? A lot of ammunition, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 131. Do you recognize that? I do. What's that? It's a disassembled 45 Colt cartridge with a type of bullet known to the shooting community as a semi wad cutter bullet. The red material is just a, uh, a lubricant that can be any color. So it's not the red color that's important, it's the shape of the nose of this bullet called a semi wad cutter. And what's this? Uh, that states Exhibit 132. Uh, that's a much better picture of the contents of that packet. The cartridge case is on the right. The semi wad cutter cast lead bullet. This bullet was made in a bullet mold. Uh, is right there. You can see the truncated cone is the $10 description of that nose shape. It was going to be a cone, got truncated at the top. Again, semi wad cutter bullets, the other name for it. And in the vial is the propellant, and that's a propellant uh, very well known to me called Trail Boss. It's designed and intended for cowboy action shooting and lead bullets in traditional firearms like this. And sir, what was your understanding of of the the source of this cartridge and, and when I say source I mean in terms of the relevant locations in this case. This was one of a number of cartridges like this that came from a supplier in Albuquerque of uh, ammunition, okay. props, uh, dummy cartridges, so on. Do you know if that was PDQ props? Yes, that, I recognize the name. Okay, thank you. And States Exhibit 133, what's this? This is one of five live cartridges that were recovered by investigators from this scene. Uh, you can see, probably see, that the powder looks very different. It's smaller, it's darker, it doesn't have that little donut shape. Um, the bullet style is also very different. Uh, setting the blue lubricant aside, this is a round nose bullet with a truncated nose. So it would have been completely round had the bullet mold not had this flat area uh, to produce this, this flat appearance. And this is pretty much like a traditional bullet from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And again, a cartridge case, 45 Colt cartridge case is on the left. So if we have a live primer in that cartridge and put it all back together, it's a live cartridge, not a dummy. So Mr. Haig, if I went to a gun store and I bought a box of ammunition, would, let's say I'm buying 45 Colt caliber ammunition, would that box perhaps include what we're seeing in 133 and also what we're seeing in 132? From professionally made purchased ammunition, you're not gonna see an m and situation or mixed, mixed bullets. They're all gonna be the same weight, style, same kind of propellant, same head stamps and of course the same kind of primer. They can come either nickel plated or plain uh, brass. And the live ammunition that was taken from the set of the movie Rust, 
Um, can you describe the characteristics of that live ammunition in terms of the head stamp, uh, the primer, uh, those just sort of exterior identifying? Yes, if we could go back to the other sure. e exhibit with the blue bullet, there's one of them. Uh, you can't see the primer, of course, because the cartridge is turned sideways, but it's a nickel-plated primer. It looks like chrome, you know, shiny nickel-plated. Uh, if it were back-loaded, you would only see the top, basically, half of the bullet. The part with the blue lubricant would be inside the cartridge case, and the powder, the gunpowder, in the little vial would, of course, be inside that cartridge. So. Putting it all back together, you'd have a complete round of ammunition. The head stamp, you've probably heard that term plenty of times, so I don't need to define it, for these cartridges was Starline. It's a very well-known manufacturer of cartridge brass. They do not manufacture loaded ammunition, at least not as I sit here today. So Starline's well-known. I use it myself. I'm a hand loader. Um, that's what you would see if we turned that cartridge up so you could see it. And what color was the primer on the live ammunition? I think I said it, but I'll repeat it. Nickel-plated, shiny. I apologize. Thank you. Um, and let me ask you, do you know, can cartridges and ammunition that look exactly like this be purchased at local gun stores? In the gun stores I, I go to, yes. And. Uh, at my request, did you obtain some and send me some pictures? Both my son and I bought boxes of commercial 45 Colt ammunition with lead round nose bullets with a flat uh, meplet is the fancy word, M-E-P-L-A-T. It's the flat spot on the nose. The powders weren't necessarily identical to what we see here, but they're a type of pistol powder. Um, States Exhibit 141, what's this? This is the outer box of one of those which I believe my uh, younger son Mike bought this one. Uh, HSM is a small ammunition company. Uh, you can probably read it's meant for cowboy action shooting. It's a popular contest with uh, traditional single action shooters. Uh, and those cartridges have the Starline head stamp and lead uh, bullets with flat noses on them. I'm going to get there. Let's go to States Exhibit 140. What, what's this? Well, you can see four of the cartridges and their head stamp in an oblique view. Uh, that They don't say star line, but that's their symbol. Two little asterisks with a line going between them. Uh, and then, of course, the cartridge designation 45 cold and nickel primers, shiny nickel colored uh, metal. And States Exhibit 143. This further characterizes the weight. In the United States, bullets are weighed in an archaic term, frankly, called grains. 7,000 of them in a pound. Uh, but 250 grain is the traditional classic weight of the Colt bullet. So this company, HSM, now tells us you can expect if you were to shoot one of these bullets and collect it and put it on a balance that weighs in grains, it's going to be around 250 grains, plus or minus a grain or two from the shooting and impact process. So the grain comes from weighing the bullet? That's right, just the bullet, not the cartridge or the powder. And just as, as an aside, did, did you um, examine the uh, projectile from this case, the projectile that was removed from Mr. Souza. Yes. And uh, are, are you aware of whether or not that projectile was 250 grain at the time that the FBI had it and the time that you had it? Yeah. No, it had lost some weight. It started out life, in my opinion, as a 250 grain bullet, but it suffered reduction uh, from probably two sources, a heavily fouled bore in other words, the gun barrel through which this passes had a lot of fouling in it from a uh, black powder substitute. I was able to duplicate that phenomenon, so the bullet now, like squeezing toothpaste, gets squeezed down a little bit and it gets some rubbed off. Plus, it went through two people and it struck bone. If you've seen pictures of it, 
or if you do it later it's got a lot of impact damage from striking bone so for those two reasons it weighed about 240 grains as I recall 10 grains is not much uh, and it was now reduced in diameter to about 44 instead of 45 um, but in your opinion, that projectile started out as a 45 Colt, 250 grain bullet. Yes. Um, and let me go to States Exhibit 144. What's this? One of the cartridges from that box of ammunition that you saw earlier has now been removed. So you see it's nice and shiny and new in the brass. And the bullet is again not too unlike the one with the blue lubricant in it. It's round nose and it's truncated, so it has that flat uh, front called a meplet. And just for completeness, States Exhibit 146. Yes, it's just a closer view of one of the cartridges from that HSM ammunition company. Uh, so this cartridge has the same physical characteristics in terms of the shape of the bullet, is that right? As, and we're comparing them to the live rounds found on set. Yes. Um, and th it, they have, both have brass casings, is that correct? Yes. Uh, they both have the Starline brass head stamp. That's right. And they both have nickel plated primers. Yes, yes they do. Thank you. We'll just need to make a note of it, like you did. I appreciate that. Let's connect over here. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, did you meet me in August at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? August yes. of 2023? Yes. And, and can you summarize for the ladies and gentlemen uh, of the jury uh, what the exercise was that we engaged in that day with uh, also I think your son was assisting us. Yes he was. Um, I had been requested, we had been requested to reassemble the evidence revolver with the broken parts, mainly the hammer and the uh, the trigger, or with the, just I think just the broken hammer with the knocked off full cock step to see if it even could be cocked and would retain the cocked position. And while we were there, did we take some videos? I'm sorry. Did you record some videos while we were there? Yes, we actually did it a number of times after we reassembled it with and without the cylinder in the revolver and videotaped, I think, six runs in one session and three or six in the other. We're only going to watch two. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's do it. I've, I'm going to press... I'm going to get them started once you give me the screen. What's that? This is an exhibit. Thank you, Judge. Where are we? We're up to 147 now. So this will be 147. This is 147. Okay, hang on. Bear with me here. We're ready. Oh, so we're stop. Let me we're stop it. Move into evidence. States 147 and 148. Any objections? It's, it's actually going to be 147 and 147A. Okay. 
All right, any objection? No, you're All right, so 147, 147A is admitted. You may publish. Let me turn that volume down. I'll play States Exhibit 147. Hang on. I took it down too far. With the following exceptions. Is there an issue with audio? Is the evidence provided? Describe what uh, we've done uh, to put it back in operating condition. All the parts on the revolver are original with the following exceptions. This is a new trigger and sear, same piece. It's the original hammer. It does also have a replacement bolt or cylinder catch. Otherwise, as mentioned, every pin, screw, spring, whether that's the main hammer spring or the flat spring that operates the trigger, are original to the revolver. So we, what we did is, j just, just as a recap, this, this is the Baldwin gun, is that right? That's correct. And the hammer, or I'm sorry, the, the trigger is, is, a, is a new unbroken trigger, is that correct? That's also correct. And the bolt uh, that we saw in the photos that had kind of lost an ear, is that replaced? Yes. But the hammer that's in this gun is the original hammer from this gun, is that correct? But damaged, yes, and that was the whole point. Does the damage, how does it affect the operation of the gun if we isolate the hammer? Um, so this is the hammer that you believe was damaged at the FBI? Yes. The full composition. Hammer falls and is captured at the half cock position. Again. So what did you what, what did you ask your son to do? He's the one holding the gun. Uh, I asked him to go through the normal cycle. If you produced this firearm and cocked it and expected the hammer to stay cocked until you pulled the trigger, it will not. Because that full cock step or notch has been rounded off, the perfectly brand new trigger cannot retain the full cock position. The hammer falls to what you just saw and it falls to that half cock notch. So the good hand trigger and its sear drop into that notch, preventing the gun from firing. So that's, a, that's intentional. That's what Mr. Colt intended. If somehow the gun got worn and the hammer started to drop when you cocked it, it's gonna get captured. And if it gets past that point, it'll be captured by the quarter cock notch. Okay, demonstrate the positions of the hammer, normal positions. From full down where the firing pin is protruding from the breech. Uh, can you see the firing pin protruding from the breech in this video? Yes, when I first described how this gun works for you, the hammer is fully down. So it's either just fired a cartridge, or this would not be a good way to carry this gun with live ammunition, because that firing pin is resting right against a live primer. If there was a cartridge in this gun, and it wouldn't take much of a blow. You don't have to hit it hard. Just drop it from a few inches in this configuration, and it'll fire. To the cock. And from here, the trigger will not allow the hammer to drop because of the shape of the notch in the hammer. From the half cock or load condition also, pulling the trigger does not drop the hammer. And the cylinder is now out of alignment with the axis of the bore. And then the... Tell us what you mean there, and why is that important uh, in gun handling? You indicated that the cylinder yes. is now out of alignment with the axis of the bore. 
Well, the two things you just saw was starting to bring the hammer back all the way. It went through the safety notch, cylinder still locked up. But when you get to this position, the cylinder now rotates a few degrees, more than a few, about 10 or so. If somehow you were able to fire this gun from that position that you're looking at in the screen right now, there's going to be a real disaster because the bullet can't go down the barrel. Maybe half of it might, but the other half is going to be jammed up against that area. That's really hard to do. Uh, and you're probably going to blow the cylinder apart. You may get injured. So there again, what Mike and I were demonstrating is if you, it's called a slip off. It, if you're trying to cock the gun and you lose your grasp on it, the hammer falls, that safety notch captures it. And now if we get this far, it still is going to be captured, but somehow if it got past that, the safety notch, you're going to have a, a damaged at the minimum or a destroyed gun and probably an injury to yourself. And in this position where the cylinder is, is no longer aligned with the axis of the bore, uh, does the firing pin hit the primer every time? No, it can hit it just at one side, and primers are designed to detonate, and it's a proper term, with basically a central hit in the primer. If you get off to one side, you'll often have a misfire, a failure to fire. And if it gets any further than that, it hits out in the head stamp area, doesn't hit the primer at all. The more that cylinder rotates out of phase. Which will be caught when released drops. And with lateral pressure, both directions, this one slipping the thumb off to the right side of the hammer, this one slipping the thumb off to the left side of the hammer, all catch on the half cock as long as the trip. Why the example of the hammer slipping? Why would we do that example? Yeah. It, can, it can be a misadventure with this kind of firearm. One of them I described, you're trying to cock it and you lose control of it. If you haven't pulled the trigger, what you just saw will happen. Nothing. It'll capture the hammer. The, uh, similarly, you can cock a gun and then decide, as I demonstrated, I want to let the hammer down. I don't, you don't want it cocked. You're going to have to pull the trigger. You're going to have to coast that hammer down with a good thumb on this area called the spur. And when it gets past the safety notch, the proper thing is to let go of the trigger and the safety notch will capture it once again. All right, this is August 24, 2023. Right. Mike Haig and Luke Haig at the Santa Fe Sheriff's Laboratory. No. Let's look at State's Exhibit 147A. This is all. Just tell us before we play it, what are we looking at here? This is the same evidence revolver. You're now looking at the other side, and we've removed the cylinder and the cylinder pin. Uh, is everything still the same, though? We've got damaged hammer. Everything else works. Yes, everything else is the same. I think we wanted to see the stop latch working at, some, at one point. OK, we'll go ahead and play this. 2023 in the property room of the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office. And Mike, you're on to describe what we've done to the evidence gun. So it's the item one revolver, the Pieta. Original parts include all the pins, screws, grip, the original hammer. It has the original hammer spring as well as the original flat spring that operates the trigger. The trigger is a replacement trigger, so the top of the sear is a functioning original piece and as said, uh, original hammer. It does have a replacement bolt as well. Otherwise, all parts are original. Okay, and the hammer's in the fully forward position at this stop. The normal full cock position. Hammer falls, doesn't hold, but the half cock notch captures it. Let's do it again. I'll take it all the way down. We can see the quarter cock notch also functions half cock functions and then all the way to full and you can see the stop latch finally in that view it's this little piece right 
there. It went down when it got to the half cock and then came back up when it reached the full cock position because that locks the cylinder in alignment with the axis of the barrel. And again, when it was in the full cock position uh, and it was released and it fell and was caught at half cock, that was why? That was as designed. That's what it should do. In that situation, the cylinder would have been aligned, but it, in a way it doesn't matter because it wouldn't fire. No, I'm talking about uh, when when your son pulled it into the full cock position and it didn't stay there. Why didn't it stay oh. there? Again, the former uh, full cock notch or step has just been beaten off. It's just it's just rounded. There's, there's no step there any longer. So it'd be the same as the edge of this witness stand. If it were round, I couldn't do that. It'd slip off. Okay, I'm just going to go slowly through the video so that we can see the bolt that you were referring to. So I'm starting this uh, video at 1 minute 9 seconds. There you can see the stop latch right now. It's up because it's locking the cylinder if the cylinder were in the gun. And it's still up because we're falling from the full cock. If we'd come from the hammer down to this very position, it lowers itself so we can rotate the cylinder and load and unload the gun. Okay. Um. Just for completeness, we'll finish playing it. Cold, but the half cock notch captures it. Let's do it again. I'll take it all the way down. We can see the quarter cock notch also functions. Half cock functions. And then all the way to full. And it fails to hold, but is captured at the half cock. I'll apply some lateral pressure to the hammer as I release it as well. That was to the right. This is to the left. because of the notches on the hammer pulling the trigger at the safety notch or the load condition, those do not release the hammer. Okay, I think that covered. So based on the experiment that we did with this gun back in August of 2023, um, even if the hammer of the gun was damaged on October 21st of 2021, would the trigger have to be pulled for the gun to fire? Two things. Yes, the trigger would have to be depressed or pulled. The hammer would have to be at the full cock position and it can't be damaged because it would do what we saw here and what you just saw here would not fire the gun. So hypothetically though, even if it were damaged on October 21st, the operator, that being Mr. Baldwin, would have had to have pulled the trigger. If he, yes, if you could get the hammer to stay at the full cock position, <laughs> that's, that's the, the difficulty to overcome. Which it doesn't want to do. It will not do. Okay. Um, and did you have an opportunity to examine the uh, spent casing uh, from from the the rust movie set in this case yes i did uh, did you make any conclusions about whether or not that spent casing was fired from this gun yes i did what's that i'm in agreement with the fbi examiner i was able to match it under the microscope there are tool marks on the breech face of the gun that print themselves literally stamp themselves into the primer and he had, there were a number of test fired cartridges that the Bureau prepared, that I prepared, and under a specialized microscope for this purpose, I could see a very nice identification. So, in my view, the fired cartridge was fired in this gun. And then I went on to look at the shape, location, and depth of the firing pin impression as the next important question. And let's go ahead and talk about that. Uh, the, the, everything that you learned 
from the firing pin impression and what that tells you about the position that the hammer of the gun was in at the time it was fired. It tells me two things, that the cylinder was locked up and aligned, so the hammer had been pulled all the way rearward. If it had not, it wouldn't be in alignment from what I've shown you. Secondly, the depth of the firing pin impression told me from doing test fires, multiple test fires, and measuring all the 12 that the FBI lab conducted, that it was a cartridge that was fired from a full hammer fall, not from an effort to let the hammer down and slip off um, or any other misadventure, but rather a normal hammer fall from the full cock position. One final demonstration for us, if you would take your revolver out and come in front of the, the jurors. And you can stand right here so that you can speak into the microphone. So just for completeness, I would like for you to demonstrate uh, to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury using this exemplar revolver um, the position that the what had to have happened on October 21st in your opinion for this gun to fire. Let's show them rather than give them a verbal description. It had to have a normally function undamaged hammer. The handler, in this case Mr. Baldwin, had to get it to this position. If he let go of the hammer, it would stay as you see it here. Pulling the trigger will fire. Now you can do that as quick as you're cocking, or you can wait minutes, hours. But when I do that, if there's a live round in there, it's going to fire. The firing pin impression is going to have the full depth from this. If, and I've done it, if somehow I did this, I'm trying to let it down, and I let it slip, it either won't fire at all, or it makes a much shallower firing pin impression. I did that multiple times with the evidence gun and with the exemplars. I own several of these. My son owns several of them. So I could distinguish by the depth and the centering, this was a normal hammer fall from the full cock position. So had the gun fired at a position le less than full cock, lower than full cock, in between full and half, or half and quarter, you would be able to tell that by the depth of the firing pin impression. Is that correct? If it, what I call a slip off. If you're trying to let the hammer down and you get about the halfway point and it slips, you also have to pull the trigger, by the way, uh, it'll be a much shallower firing pin impression. It doesn't hit the strike. It doesn't strike as hard. And from the quarter cock, if you're trying to put it in safety position and you lose control of it, again, you have to pull the trigger. It just makes an indentation in the primer doesn't fire at all. Um, thank you, sir, if you can take your seat. <clears throat> sir, it, in the, the what we call the discovery, in, in the documents and information that you reviewed, did you have an opportunity to review some videos of Mr. Baldwin on set in the church pulling the gun out of his holster. Yes, I did. And are you familiar with that type of holster? Yes. Are you um, familiar with this type of gun? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with this type of gun? Oh. I think you've indicated you are. Yes, I think I own six or seven of them. Okay. Um, is there anything particularly difficult or dangerous about pulling this style revolver out of that style holster in your opinion? Not so long as you don't load it, or if you do load it, that you don't cock it and pull the trigger. Otherwise, it's safe. It's an easy movement to make. Uh, I have no problem with how to do that. When you say it's an easy movement to make, can you think of anything, you know, that the gun might get caught on or uh, or or anything that that could create danger? Not realistically again. The hammer secures itself well to be drug across clothing, uh, and if it fell without a trigger pull, um, and the trigger's well shielded with a trigger guard, but if somehow the hammer got pulled off the full cock position, you've already seen what's going to happen. It gets captured at the half cock position. All right, thank you. I'll pass the witness. Mr. Bow, I'll have you disconnect us. Can I maybe approach for a moment?
take our lunch break. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, we'll be back at um, council. What time do you think? Council. Yes, Your Honor. I apologize. Well, it's 11:38. You want a uh, quarter of? Yeah. Sure. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. So uh, quarter of one. Quarter of one. Do I have that right? <laughs> yes, you have that right. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Um, and since you're a witness, don't talk to other witnesses. I understand. Yeah. All rise.
All right, you may be seated. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, I wanted to ask you first uh, off, I think your conclusion, what you stated earlier, is that based on your expert review of that Baldwin revolver, the shooter had to have fully cocked that weapon and pulled that trigger to cause it to fire. Is that? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, let me start over, if it's okay, Your Honor. Okay, uh, sir, if I can ask that again. I think your conclusion, and correct me if I'm wrong, was that the Baldwin revolver that you examined in your expert opinion, that the shooter had to have fully cocked that weapon and had to have pulled that trigger all the way, pulled the trigger to fire it. Yes, on the first part, I bifurcated my answer in the report, either pull the trigger, which I regard as a volitional act, or have already depressed it. If yes, sir. already depressed it, the very instant he let go of the hammer, it would fire. So, sir, for example, if Mr. Baldwin were cross-drawing that weapon and had his finger in the trigger guard, and then he pulled it and it had it fully cocked and, and it slipped and let go, would that fire that weapon? Only if he had the trigger pulled or depressed. They're okay. similar, but I make a slight distinction between it being depressed versus pulled. Okay, so, sir, so either way, that shooter had to either have it depressed, have his finger in the trigger, or pull that trigger for that to fire. And have it cocked. And have it cocked. Fully cocked. Fully cocked. Yes. Okay. Okay, now I noticed earlier when you were uh, doing a demonstration with the jury, uh, you exercised extreme muzzle discipline, I'm going to call it. Um, you learned that, correct? Not to ever point that weapon at a, an individual, a human? Long ago. Yes, sir. Been around guns a long time? I have. And one of the most important rules, and I saw when you walked down, you had it either down, up, it was never pointed at a person. That's one of the most important rules of gun safety, isn't it? I agree. Okay. And sir, another rule that I noticed when your son was on that video, um, and when you were demonstrating, you never had your finger in that trigger guard. Is that another rule you learned from a uh, long time ago? Well, we were demonstrating something there which had, in which the trigger yes. saved the, the gun from firing. If we had depressed it, of course, it wouldn't be a useful demonstration. No, and I understand. I, my question wasn't good. You never put your finger in that trigger guard until you were ready to pull that trigger in some manner. Yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> with regard to the cross draw, and I know you've been around guns for a long time. But with regard to the cross draw, would you agree that somebody that was not familiar with that draw would need to have training on that draw? You'd have to have some understanding of where the firearm is, how the holster works, whether it's got a safety strap or not, and then of course get it out of that area and swing it around as was shown in the videos that I've looked at of Mr. Baldwin. Yes sir, and did you see the video where when he pulls it out, his finger is in the trigger guard. Did you see that? I certainly did. And again, that can be very dangerous, sir, based on your expert conclusion, if he has that fully cocked, correct? And it's loaded and fully cocked, yes. Yes, sir. And so when you watched that video, did you make a determination as to whether he should have drawn that with his finger in the trigger guard? It's been a while since I've looked at it. I was trying to decide if a couple of other things. If that's the evidence gun, I was satisfied it was because of the plain bare metal hammer. 
And then, of course, looking at, can I really determine if his finger's inside the trigger guard but not on the trigger itself? I could never never resolve that Okay. because of the camera angle. And in any event, um, you should not have your finger on the trigger in that cross draw. Well, it doesn't matter what it's a cross draw. It's if you're going to cock the gun, which he did after it's out. I do remember that. Yeah. When it's out of the holster, you can see him cocking it. It's now clear of the holster. But we're back to, or I'm back to, I can't tell if he's already got the trigger depressed or it gets pulled later. Okay, sir. <clears throat> and with regard to your conclusion, I want to make sure I was clear on that. I know that you, um, and I, I don't want to use the word critical, but you didn't think that aggressive testing by the FBI was a good idea? I didn't think it was necessary in this case given the context. What are the issues in the case? There, in my mind, it was never an issue that the hammer got struck by anything or that the gun got dropped. And so you didn't believe that the FBI even needed to do that test? From my viewpoint, no. No, it okay. was not a, a useful or necessary test to strike the hammer of the fully cocked evidence gun. Did you also say that you did not find any damage to that weapon that would have prevented it from firing as designed? And I'm talking about not after the FBI, but prior. Is that your conclusion? Yes, if the hammer were replaced and the trigger replaced and the bolt it was a perfectly functioning, authentic replica of a classic firearm. Okay, sir, and, and in your inspection of that weapon, that Baldwin revolver, did you see any modifications that would have changed the firing um, characteristics of that weapon? No, not at all. In fact, I went through, I think there are 12 other revolvers, nine of them are Pietas, and I took them all apart with the help of my younger son, Mike, and we looked at the sears, the triggers, the uh, full cock notches, and they were all equivalent. You could have swapped them out because they're carefully manufactured parts. So that's how I addressed and answered that question in my own mind. Okay, sir. So other than the FBI uh, testing, breaking those components, you didn't see any other evidence of modification or damage? I did not. Okay, sir. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the, the rounds that you were talking about, the um, Starline brass is used by hand loaders at times. Hand loaders use Starline brass, is that true? Yes, it's, that's their primary market. I'm one of their consumers. Uh, small ammunition companies like the one in the box of ammunition that the prosecutor showed earlier have also used their brass. Remington, Winchester, they of course have their own. So, uh, and can you tell the jury uh, a hand loader if they use um, I mean, they can use any type of primer, any type of powder, any type of bullet in a case, right? In the no, handle. no, that, that's definitely not true. Okay, how do, how do, what is a... Well, let's start with the primer. That's the spark plug in your car. It's the spark plug in ammunition. There are large pistol primers and there are small pistol primers. The Colt cartridge requires a large pistol primer. There are also rifle primers that have the same dimensions but they're harder and usually have more explosive in them. The same way there's small rifle primers. So you got four types. Then they could be plain brass, if that's your pleasure for aesthetics, or nickel plated. And I've seen them both ways. So we got four types and two finishes. There are even some that are custom for bench rest shooting and other exotic competition, but those are the four main. The powders, yet another thing. They're powders that are specifically manufactured for handguns. You've got a big bore and a heavy bullet that's got to be accelerated in a short distance, so <clears throat> those powders have to burn very fast and produce their energy. Rifle powders, if you shoot a 30-30 or a 30-06, you couldn't take the powder that's in one of your rifle cartridges and put it in a pistol cartridge and get it to work. It would basically fizzle or squib. They burn it. It's like sawdust, sticks, and logs. Powders burn at different rates for shotguns, pistols, and rifles. So there's a lot of uh, thought that's gone into this over the last century and a half of how you make all this come together to not blow up the gun, to achieve the desired pressure and velocity, and of course, produce an accurate shot. Yes, sir. And so did you have any evidence when you looked at the live rounds from the rest set that those were 
hand loads or those were some other type? Did you determine that? Well, they're in Starline brass, which is sold for hand loaders. But as I said, a commercial manufacturer can buy Starline brass, just as you saw in that one box. The bullets look more amateurish to me. Uh, in fact, I have that same bullet uh, with a blue loop, and it's a cast bullet. It doesn't come in cartridges. Um, so I don't have a definitive answer on you. They, they were virgin cases. That means they hadn't been fired previously and then reloaded. They were shiny inside. Um, so they were first time assembled. And the powder, uh, their physical forms, just uh, as I mentioned, look like a powder called bullseye, which is probably the oldest pistol powder around. It's very popular. I use it myself. Uh, it's normally associated with hand loaders. But it doesn't stop the industry from buying a, you know, a ton of it and loading a few million rounds. Okay, sir. So, so you didn't make a definitive determination, but those rounds appeared amateurish, which would be more like a hand load. Is that fair? Yes, that's, that has kind of a, a demeaning character to it. I, I pride myself on my hand loads, and they look fine, but they'd already been disassembled, so I didn't get to see the quality of the crimp and just where the crimp was made. That's where you hold the bullet in the cartridge case. I wished I'd seen them before they were disassembled. Disassembled, so, but but when you looked at it, it did appear, I'm just trying to establish, it did appear more likely to be a hand load. Yes. Okay. And if I could, if we could have a, um, okay. Gunner, if I may approach the witness. Are you gonna mark that? Yeah, right, this is State's Exhibit 110. This has right. already been no admitted. Yes. Okay. It's already been admitted into evidence. Oh, yeah. If we can put. Mr. Haig, I hope you can see this. Yes, I can. Okay, do you see this is State's Exhibit 110 that's been introduced? Uh, have you ever seen this photo? Yes, I have. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me get that. So, Mr. Haig, on the right um, that you're looking at right now, I have it under it. What is that type of powder? It's a pistol powder. In my opinion, it's one called Trail Boss. That's a brand name designed for cowboy action loads in handgun, centerfire handgun cartridges. And its characteristic shape, as I say, it looks like little donuts or tires if you magnify it. And it's a, a dull gray. It's also what's called a single base powder. Uh, so I, I use it myself. It's, it's an old friend. It works well. Okay, sir, and now I'm going to move this over and I'm going to show you the this other type of powder, and, and what do you call that type of powder? Of the many physical forms, it's called disc flake. That's with a hyphen, disc flake. It's little flakes in the sharp shape of discs, like little gray hockey pucks under the microscope. And without a scale, I couldn't compare that any further to, say, bullseye or some of the other disc flake powders. Okay, and now I'm gonna try to zoom in here. Um, do you see in the middle of the the ones you just described? Do you see that donut-looking shape right in the middle? I see it. I don't see it as a powder particle. It's something in the the holding device. And, and by holding device, what do you mean by that? I don't know. I didn't have benefit of having this in my hand to actually empty it out, as I recall. So I don't know what it is. It's not powder, that's all. You don't, you don't think it's powder? I'm convinced it is not a propellant oh. or powder. Okay. But you don't recall that particular thing when you looked at it or when you, when you had it? Or what did you just say? I didn't understand. If I looked at it, I was again, firsthand, I was again interested in the propellant as to whether I could identify it on the basis of morphology. And I, I didn't get anywhere beyond it's a disc flake powder 
popularly used in pistol cartridges, handgun cartridges. Okay. So as part of your work in this case, did you ever see the photographs from PDQ props from Seth Kenny's business? I know I saw a number of photographs after a, a production of materials there, search warrant I suppose you'd call it, and a lot of the ammunition, plus the FBI did a lot of x-ray images of cartridges from that facility. Did you remember the um, way that that place looked in terms of its organization or disorganization? Only vaguely. Okay. All right. And it may, we may show you some pictures of that, but you never went there personally. I have not been there. Okay. And you've had no contact with Seth Kenny yourself. That's also correct. I, I don't know the man. I've not met him. Okay. Did you, with regard to the rounds on set, did you um, measure or inspect all of the rounds? For example, we've been evidence there's been 250 dummy rounds. Did you go through all of those? Over a period of five days, yes. Okay. And did you go through um, all of the, the live rounds, you said? Yes, definitely. Okay. Looked at the all disassembled, but five rounds. Okay. And other than what you've told us, uh, anything else about those live rounds? You did tell us the blue loop. Any other uh, matters that you investigated that you determined about those? Well, I probably said earlier this morning, I, those are hard cast, meaning the lead has been hardened. It's not dead soft lead like uh, you get out of an x-ray machine. Cast bullets, there's another way you can make bullets that the manufacturers do, but casting with a mold, bullet mold. Uh, and yes, I, I now must recall the propellant in the disassembled live rounds looked like the powder I mentioned, bullseye. And I didn't see that in other, other sources in this case. Now, sir, do you, uh, can you tell a jury what a light strike misfire is, if that term's familiar to you? Yes, I'd usually separate the terms, but let's just start with a, a misfire is a cartridge fails to fire for some reason. A light strike could be one of those reasons. That means the hammer didn't fall its full distance or it was uh, retarded by something. Uh, uh, it was going to fall, but something got caught up in it. Uh, or, the example I gave earlier, and I did it with the actual evidence gun, pull the hammer back with real ammunition, pull the hammer back to the quarter cock, that little distance where the safety would set, but I had the trigger depressed, and then let the hammer fall. That would make, it'd be actually hard to see, a little tick mark, T-I-C-K, a little tick mark in the primer, but it wouldn't fire it. And, and observing that after that happened, if you observed that round and you could see that little strike in the primer, um, is it true that, that that round could still go off the next, the next hit? Yes. If it didn't fire and a primer had a tick mark, one of these little light indentations in it, and you put it back in the firearm and drew the hammer all the way back, it's, it's going to fire. Okay. And, sir, one other area on the, you mentioned that the gun barrel, the Baldwin revolver, that it was, uh, it was dirty. Well, it had to be dirty when the evidence bullet went down the barrel. Okay. And let me just ask you, does it take some time for an individual to properly clean a gun that's been uh, firing black powder? Uh, whether black powder, uh, I saw no evidence black powder was used in this case, but I know what you mean. There's a substitute called triple seven, uh, which acts like black powder. They both leave a lot of residue in the gun barrel. And it can be difficult to get out, especially if you don't know what you're doing because it's largely water soluble and modern powders like you just showed me in the picture are not water soluble. So you need to know okay, this is triple seven or black gunpowder, and I've got to get this stuff out. You, you're going to have to scrub it out with soap, hot, soapy water is the best way, and then dry the gun barrel out. Okay, sir, and I know you, I appreciate that. I know you operate a business. Were you paid or compensated in this case for your work? For my time, of course. Yes, sir, and how much uh, have you been compensated? Well, my wife handles the bookkeeping, so... I don't, I don't know for sure, but there's been quite a few hours. As I said, five days just looking at all this evidence alone. And then another when I came over here in July to look at the clothing, and then in August for the videos you saw. So there's five, six, seven, eight or so days. And what's your hourly rate? 350 per hour. Okay. 
Okay, and I, I thank you for your time. You're welcome. Redirect. Mr. Haig, did you look at all of the disassembled live rounds from the set of rust? Yes. Did any of the primers on those live rounds have those tick marks? No. And just to be clear, when we were looking at photos earlier, the, the photo of the ammunition that came from PDQ props, you described that bullet as a semi-wad cutter. Yes. Okay. Um, and can you definitively say that the live rounds from the set of rust were kind of homemade sort of reloads as opposed to the HSM brand that we looked at on the on the photos that you you and your son purchased yeah I wouldn't demean that ammo to ammunition to that degree there's just a it's subtle but if you shoot all the time and load ammunition I recognize them as in all likelihood hand loads I wouldn't describe them as shoddy or poorly made or uh, Sometimes I'll see dents in cartridge cases and the bullets been improperly seated. So nothing wrong with them. They look like perfectly suitable hand loads. I've seen prettier. I've sure seen a lot worse. Are you, I, I just want to be clear, are you testifying to the jury that you don't believe uh, that those rounds that were found on the set would have come from a small manufacturer like HSM? I can't rule it out, but the, the ammunition I've purchased in 45 Colt from various manufacturers and those that my younger son Mike has purchased have a higher quality. The bullets uh, are slicker, shinier. Okay. Um, and you were asked some questions on cross-examination about uh, gun safety and, uh, and, and Mr. Baldwin having his, his finger in the, in the trigger guard of that gun. Do you recall those questions? I do. Based on your review of the evidence in this case, is it your understanding that Mr. Baldwin was told that the gun was cold or inert before he put his finger in the trigger guard? Yes. It's my understanding from reading the documents the call cold gun was given, meaning there's a gun on the set, but there's nothing in it that's going to go, that's going to fire. No blanks or, of course, live rounds. And the, the dummies in this case uh, that, that rattled, you examined some of those, didn't you? Yes, I did, a number of them. Do you mind my asking, sir, how old you are? 83. And, sir, with your 83-year-old ears, were you able to clearly hear the rattle? Not always. Not Speci always. Especially in my right ear. Okay. Yeah. Um, and do, you it, think that do, that, do you think that's a, an issue with your hearing? I thought it was subtle even when I listened with my good ear, my left ear. The rattle was subtle. Yes. So in order to, in order to hear that rattle, you have to listen pretty closely, right? Yes, and it gets more complicated. Some of them had one pellet in them, others had two or three. So now you've got the advantage if you happen to pull one that's got three in it, better opportunity to hear it rattle. Okay. Uh, sir, are you familiar with the term uh, inertia bullet puller? Sure. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, it's a very simple device. It looks a little bit like a hammer, only it's clear plastic. It's got a cap, and you put a usually a live cartridge or maybe one that's failed to fire. Anyway, it's a cartridge. It's got a bullet cartridge case, primer. Put it in this device and you hit it on a hard surface. Good old Isaac Newton works out for us. The hammer stops and the heavy bullet keeps on going. Now, it may take three or four hits, but you separate the bullet from the cartridge in a non-destructive way. So you get the bullet, you get all the powder, and you get a cartridge case. It's pretty routine if we want to know What's this ammunition loaded with? How much powder? What kind of bullet? Because you can't see all the bullet when it's in the cartridge case. So it's a common tool. I think I have two or three of them. So the inertia puller is a device that is designed to disassemble live ammunition. Is that right? Yes. Thank you, sir. I don't have anything else. All right. Thank you, sir. Excuse.
Next witness. Uh, we will call uh, Corporal Alex Hancock. Where is he? Thank you. Do you swear affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Detective Hancock, go ahead and state your name for the record. Uh, Alexander Hancock. How are you currently employed? I am currently a corporal with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been employed at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? A little over six years now. And it, it, have, have you only worked at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? Yes. Okay. Um, on October 21st, 2021, um, what was your position with the department? Um, so on October 21st, 2021, I was a detective in the Criminal Investigations Division, and I was assigned to the Violent Crimes Division. And how did you become involved in this case? Uh, I became involved in the um, Rust case. We were working that day and in the office and um, got notified that there was a shooting on a movie set. And when you received that information, what did you do? Um, so we met um, essentially as a team in investigations and at that point we had essentially split up assignments. Um, we do this with any sort of major case like a homicide, um, shooting, stabbing, anything like that. Um, so we'll meet with the supervisors and then the entire team and then at that point we'll divvy up essentially who's going to do what at that time. Tell us how you divvied things up. So um, at the initial point of this case, um, there was actually another detective that was assigned the primary, um, and I was assigned as secondary. So what that means is that um, the primary is pretty much the head of the investigation. Um, they're essentially in charge of what's going to happen, and then they divvy up uh, responsibilities for the rest of the team from there. And who was that person who was originally assigned primary? His name is Joel Connell. And is he a colleague of yours? Yes, he is. Uh, and, and at some point, uh, was that designation, designation changed, and were you assigned primary? Yes, about two weeks later. Um, on October 21st, just so that we understand who was doing what, um, can you give us the names of the people that you yourself uh, interviewed on the 21st of October? Yeah, so the day of the incident, I was assigned to um, take some individuals back to the sheriff's office to be interviewed. Um, those individuals involved Hannah Gutierrez Reed, who is um, here in the courtroom today, um, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. And those are the three people who ultimately were criminally charged in this case, correct? That is correct. Uh, would you agree with me that you did the, basically the primary interviews on October 21st? Yes. And so while you were interviewing kind of the main players on October 21st, what was Detective Kano doing? Um, so Detective Kano had stayed um, on at the ranch, so at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, and um, it was my understanding that there were additional people who were inside of the church at the time that the incident happened that he had interviewed um, and had assistance from another detective. So essentially they stayed on scene and used a, um, like a movie trailer or whatever was designated towards them to interview all those other people. 
And why were you guys interviewing people at the same time? You in one location, him in another location? Uh, because of the uh, amount of people that we had to interview, and at the sheriff's office, we only have one interview room. Now, you were present in the courtroom uh, when um, Officer Lafleur and Mr. Benavides uh, testified. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, what's your opinion with regard to their sentiments that this was a difficult scene because of the number of people? Yeah, the um, I would say it was it produced a pretty big problem for the sheriff's office just because of the fact that there were so many people um, on this movie scene, uh, hundreds of people, and there were so few of us at the time. Now, in addition to interviewing uh, Mr. Baldwin, Ms. Gutierrez, and Mr. Halls on October 21st, 2021, did you also conduct a subsequent interview with Ms. Gutierrez? Yes, I did. And was her attorney, Mr. Bowles, present for that interview? Yes, he was. And did you have uh, numerous subsequent telephone conversations with Mr. Baldwin? Yes, quite a few. Um, at any point in time after October 21st, did you uh, conduct an interview of a witness by the name of Sarah Zachary? Yes, I did handle um, her initial interview was with Detective Cano, and then I had a follow-up interview with her sometime in November with her attorney. And did you also conduct an interview with an actor by the name of Jensen Ackles? Yes, I did. Did you conduct an interview with uh, the witness that we heard from uh, earlier, uh, Catherine Rowe Walters? Yes. And did you interview a gentleman by the name of Zach Sills? Yes. Did you interview a gentleman by the name of Seth Kinney? Uh, numerous times. And when you say numerous times, how many times do you think you spoke to Mr. Kinney? Over five. Um, and did you interview a gentleman by the name of Thel Reed? Yes, I did. Let's start with um, Mr. Reed. How, how did you come to conduct an interview, and just to be clear, I think it was telephonic, is that right? Yes, it was. How did you come to conduct an interview with Mr. Reed? So my initial, um, I guess the way that I had originally heard about uh, Mr. Thel Reed was that he was Hannah's father. And um, Jason Bowles, Hannah's attorney, had actually brought him up um, after a, the second interview that I had conducted with Hannah, um, essentially saying that Thel wanted to provide a statement as to where the live ammunition may have come from on set. Um, Jason had emailed me a... When you say Jason, you mean Jason Bowles? Yes, Jason Bowles had um, emailed me a typed out statement um, and at the bottom of this statement it had Thel's name on it. Um, at that time I had advised to Jason that that would not be a sufficient statement for me um, because I hadn't conducted the interview um, myself and that essentially a, a word typed statement, um, not signed, not I really identified from anybody, would not be sufficient for me. Um, so I had discussed with Mr. Jason Bowles that if Thel wanted to provide an actual statement to me that we needed to set up an interview. And did he do that? Yes, he did the following day. And did you interview him? Yes. Was that prior, prior to um, uh, asking the court to authorize a search warrant on PDQ props? Yeah, it was about a week before. Um, and under what circumstances did you become aware of Seth Kinney in, in, a, in a manner that caused you to start to have to interview him and interact with him? Um, so from the be the beginning of the investigation, my first interactions with Seth Kenny um, came from the search warrant that we had done on the prop truck, um, which was 
on the the set of Rust. Um, Seth had, I had essentially told Seth or had communications with him that I was going to need to get inside the safe on the on the prop truck, which is where um, we were told that they had um, stored guns. And instead of breaking open this safe, um, we had asked for someone to come to set with the code for the safe um, in order to open it so we didn't have to do all that extra work. So my first interaction um, in person with Seth Kenny was during the prop truck search warrant. Um, Hang on just a second. Uh, so, so Mr. Kenny showed up and opened the safe for you? Yes, he did. Uh, and on that day that you were doing the search of the prop truck, do you recall what date it was? It was October 27th, 2021. Um, and, and did Mr. Kinney uh, kind of hang around there uh, outside the prop truck and you were able to visit with him? Yes. Was Mr. Kinney cooperative with you? Yeah, he was extremely cooperative. Um, did Mr. Kinney bring you samples of live ammunition from PDQ props? Yes, he did. And did Mr. Kinney provide you access to text messages on his cell phone? Uh, yes, several times. Did he provide you access to information on his tablet? Yes. What was the reason, or reasons rather, that you determined that conducting a search of PDQ props would be appropriate? Um, so throughout the investigation, um, we obviously had the unanswered question of where this lime, live ammunition may have come from. Um, during Hannah's secondary interview with me, um, I found that ammunition that was supplied to Rust actually came from three different sources. Um, one of those sources... Hey, and and, and let's, let, let's back up real quick but before you get there. The interview that you did with Ms. Gutierrez on October 21st, 2021, um, did you have a conversation with her about who provided ammunition to the set? Yes. And who did she say provided ammunition? Seth Kenny. And then you conducted a follow-up interview with her uh, in November. Yes. And that was when Mr. Bowles was there. Correct. And that's what you were going to start telling us about, right? Yes. Go ahead, proceed. Um, so in that secondary interview, um, Hannah had disclosed that there were actually three sources of ammunition um, that went onto the set of Rust. One of them, her original, being Seth Kenny um, from PDQ, Armand Prop. The second supplier was an individual named Billy Ray, um, and he was part of the business uh, Spots and Props, I believe it is what it was. And then the third um, source of ammunition for us was herself. How many boxes of dummy ammunition did Ms. Gutierrez tell you that she herself provided to the set of Rust? Uh, so one, and then she had stated that she had brought other um, dummies and ammunition in gun belts. Okay, uh, so I think what we were discussing is what went into your thought process that caused you uh, to decide that executing a search warrant on PDQ prop props would be appropriate. Yeah, so during Hannah's secondary interview, um, it was identified at that point uh, the actual physical location of PDQ, um, which was in Albuquerque, the 126 Monroe. Um, and then subsequently after that, when I had gotten the statement from Thel, Thel had described that him and Seth Kenny had been training actors on another movie prior to this in another state um, that they had used live ammunition. Um, and so Thel had said that that ammunition somehow came back to New Mexico and then, you know, potentially gone back to PDQ, which is 
the reason that I used, along with Seth Kenny providing the fact that he did have live ammunition and use live ammunition um, on that set to draft that search warrant for PDQ. Did you also have numerous conversations with Mr. Bowles? Yes. Um, and were some of the statements that Mr. Bowles made also uh, things that went into your decision to execute a search warrant there? Yes. What was the information you received from Mr. Bowles that caused you to turn your attention to Seth Kinney? Um, so from the uh, beginning of this investigation, uh, Mr. Bowles had made statements that he believed that there was sabotage on the set, um, although none of the individuals that I had interviewed um, shared the same sentiment. So none of the people that I had interviewed thought that this could be sabotage or, um, you know, that someone did this intentionally to Hannah. And so given the fact that Mr. Bowles had continuously um, told me about, you know, Seth Kenny and the fact that he may have supplied the live ammunition um, and that he was a supplier of ammunition is why we decided to take that path into investigating him. Um, now... The interview that you conducted with Mr. Reed that went into your decision uh, to apply for a search warrant, um, did Mr. Reed actually tell you specifically the kind of rounds that he recalled being on the set of 1883 that would now be in the possession of Seth Kinney? Yeah, he described the um, live ammunition to have a, a semi-watt cutter top. All right. Um, Corporal, were you present in the courtroom for opening statements? Yes. Um, did you investigate Seth Kinney? Yes, we did. And based on Mr. Bowles' communications with you and other information, you actually applied for a search warrant and you conducted a search of PDQ props, correct? Yes, I did. And. You spoke to Mr. Kenny numerous times, I think you testified to. Many, many times. And he was completely cooperative with you? Yes, for over a year, I believe. And in, Sorry, oh, no, I was just going to say, we, we had numerous conversations for an extended period of time. Um, is there any particular reason that you didn't ask him for a DNA swab or a fingerprint sample? Um, yes, so during my investigation um, and the interviews I conducted, um, there was never any testimony or reason to believe um, that Seth was ever on the set of Rust. Anything that was um, handled through him or any of the ammunition or anything that had been brought to set had been picked up by another person in Albuquerque or they had met outside of the set. Um, and, and just to be clear, Corporal, the, the live ammunition that you seized from PDQ props, what did you do with it? Uh, we submitted all the live ammunition for testing with the FBI. And did you receive information that the live ammunition from PDQ didn't match the live ammunition on the set of Rust? That's correct. It didn't match at all. And isn't that in line with what Thel Reed himself told you about that ammunition being semi-wad cutter? Yeah, so the statement that Thel had made um, about the type of ammunition that they were using matched what we found and what was provided by Seth Kenny. So you found at PDQ exactly what Thel Reed told you you should find? Yes. And it did not match the live rounds on set? That's correct. Let's talk about um, the 
cell phone extractions that were done in this case. And let's go back to October 21st when we're on set on the set of Rust. Um, do you know why cell phones from every witness on the set weren't collected? Um, there was, I mean, obviously a lot of people that we were dealing with, and um, it's not standard practice, especially when we are still investigating, to just go and take people's possessions from them. If I'm a witness to a crime, do you just get to come seize my cell phone? No. Do you get to put me in handcuffs? No. Do you get to put me in the back of a patrol unit? No. Um, in fact, there was a, an extraction of Ms. Gutierrez's cell phone, correct? That's correct. And you didn't have to ask for a warrant. She consented to that. She did consent. And was there an extraction done of Mr. Baldwin's phone? Yes. And where was that done? Um, Suffolk, Suffolk PD in New York completed it. And did Mr. Baldwin do that voluntarily or did you have to execute a warrant? So I had initially applied for a warrant for his phone um, and it was approved here in New Mexico, but he was located in New York at the time. And so we ended up, um, actually the DA's office and Mr. Baldwin's attorneys um, ended up essentially getting his phone and doing his phone on consent as well. Uh, was a cell phone extraction done of the cell phone of Mr. Halls? Yes, it was. And did you have to get a warrant or did Mr. Halls consent? He consented. Uh, same thing with Ms. Zachary. Was there an extraction of her phone? Yes. Did she consent? Yes, she did. And Mr. Kinney shared with you the information from his phone that you asked for? Yes, numerous times. Is there a reason that the prop truck wasn't searched until October 27th? Yes, so um, with the initial information that we had been given um, and that we responded to the day of the incident, um, the entire incident in itself had occurred inside the church. Um, so that was our you know, primary area that we were going to be investigating and processing and looking into because that's where the incident occurred. Um, and ad additional information that we had received was obviously involving the prop cart that Hannah um, and the props team was using and that's why we, um, you know, processed that prop cart as well. Uh, we didn't have information until later on that this prop truck had been involved in the props department and that we would potentially need to be looking for evidence there, which is why we didn't um, conduct that search until a few days later. And Corporal, why wasn't the search of PDQ props done until the end of November? Because the information that I had started um, receiving in terms of PDQ didn't come until, I believe it was November 9th. Um, the statement that I was given uh, from Thel, or my interview with Thel Reed, was November 17th. Um, I We had also um, received some evidence back from OMI November 22nd, and then I had another interview um, with Sarah, her secondary interview on November 29th. So this is all stuff that I'm involved in and I'm conducting and doing myself. So November 30th was essentially the first day that I had available to do that search warrant, and I requested the search warrant that morning and got it done that afternoon. Do criminal investigations involving a hundred witnesses sometimes take time? Absolutely, even ones that don't involve that many people. 
Um, can you explain to the jury uh, why latent fingerprint testing was not requested on the live rounds found on the set of rest? Yeah, absolutely. So during uh, my interviews with um, you know all the people that were that I initially interviewed, there was um, statements from them that this the gun that Alec Baldwin was using was taken from the church, um, that Dave Halls had taken it from the church, that he had handed that gun to Miss Reed, um, directed Miss Reed to essentially empty all the bullets from that gun. So in doing so, with Miss Reed emptying the bullets and examining them at that time, I know she touched them. I know her DNA or potentially her prints are going to be on those bullets. Um, so it didn't make sense for us to DNA or latent test that round because I know who touched it and she wasn't the only one that touched it after that. Um, in addition to that, the other live rounds that were found um, in you know gun belts, the box or the ammo box and the cart um, had all been handled by several people during this movie set, especially after the shooting. We, I, got, I had gotten statements that they had been handled by several different people. And not only that, but the gun belts that contained the live ammunition were said to have come from another set. And so for us, and in speaking with the DA's office, as well as the FBI, um, our representative from the FBI, it didn't make sense. It would be a test that just wouldn't yield anything um, that we were looking for. And why wasn't DNA testing requested on the live rounds or the spent casing? The, the spent from the gun? From, from, the, from the set, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, the spent casing from the gun or the live rounds from the set of rest. My apologies. I'm sorry, you're saying what, why wasn't it? Why requested? wasn't DNA testing requested? Okay, um, essentially for the same reason, because of um, one, well, because of all the various people that had claimed to handle these rounds. And did you also hear in previous testimony uh, that uh, about FBI policies? Yes. A and and were you uh, notified of those policies during the course of your investigation? Yes, I was. So if you had requested it, they would have refused. Correct. And we did have that discussion with our FBI representative, who was assigned to the case here in Santa Fe. Now, we understand from previous testimony that you sent the gun that was being used by Mr. Baldwin to the FBI for testing. Is that correct? Yes, we did. And prior to the testing being done with the mallet, um, were you notified that that testing could potentially result in damage to the gun? Yes. And what was the reason that you proceeded with the testing anyway? We proceeded with the testing because Mr. Baldwin had made statements um, that he didn't pull the trigger, and I think his exact statement was that the gun just went off. Um, so we needed to figure out how to disprove that theory um, or that statement, and that was the way that was proposed to us and what the FBI could do. Um, On October, I, I, I'm going to go through and I'm going to play some videos of your statements with Ms. Gutierrez at this time. Um, and on October 21st, 2021, did you have a conversation with Ms. Gutierrez when she was still on set before she was taken to the police station? Yeah, we had some, some brief discussion. Okay. And, Your, your Honor, if it's acceptable, some of these videos, the first one isn't that long, but some of these videos are rather lengthy, and so I'd like to play them from counsel's table. Sure. Instead of standing. Okay. How, how long are they? 
Um, the first one I think is about eight minutes. The second one, off the top of my head, I want to say is about an hour. And the last one is between two and three hours. All right, we'll probably take a break after the second one, the one that's an hour, okay? Uh, just as a point of clarification for the court and also for the jury, um, uh, some of these videos are, are at times redacted if there's downtime or something like that. So if you see a skip, that's why. Okay, so it's coming into evidence. Yes, and the, the first one that, uh, that I intend to play is States Exhibit 66. Um, I would ask to admit it and publish it. Mr. Bolt. No objection, Your Honor. All right, State 66 is admitted. You may publish. Yeah, where's the rest? She knows where it's at. Just going to back up. Pass your sight. She's a youth ratio. And she doesn't want to go alone. Will you escort her? Yeah, where's the rest? She knows where it's at. Okay. Get that out of the way if you would. Um, Corporal. Does this, does this microphone work? Okay. Uh, the acoustics are much different from this position. Um, Corporal, who is that gentleman you were speaking to? Uh, that was my sergeant at the time, Christopher Zook. That's the same gentleman that testified earlier in this trial? Yes. And, and what are you being asked to do? Um, I was advised that Hannah needed to use the restroom and um, that she wanted somebody to accompany her. After her? Yeah. Hi there. You said you needed to use the restroom? Yeah. Okay, I can go with you. Do you have your bag and everything? I don't know. I think it got taken. She's not. She'll just come right back here. Okay. Yeah, I'm just taking her to use the restroom and that's it. Let me just close this. Okay, where are they? Do I have to do this? Here? Can you guys just have me leave? Well, yeah, so we're going to take you, do you want to wait to go to the office, or? Is it going to be a while? Um, I'm not sure how much longer, I'd say not too much longer, but I can't okay, tell you a time. Okay. And, Corporal, I couldn't hear what Ms. Gutierrez uh, said to you at, at, at the beginning that prompted this discussion about going back to the office. Do you recall? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, no problem. <laughs> the worst day of my life. <laughs> uh, hey, things happen. Yeah? Where's your restrooms here? Right over here. Okay. I can't believe Alec Baldwin was holding the gun. That's so far. Alright, just...
can the members of the jury hear what Ms. Gutierrez is saying in the video? Okay, just checking. No, he said no. One person said no. I didn't see it. It's uh, okay. Um, could you, Corporal, could you hear what Ms. Gutierrez was saying in the video? Yes. Okay, can, can you, uh, did we just turn it up? Okay. I'll take it back just a, just a short bit and we'll, uh, we'll see if that works. Thank you, George. Okay. What did Ms. Gutierrez say to you? Um, her statement was, I can't believe Alec Baldwin was holding the gun. That's so fucked. It, and just to be clear, at this point in time, um, where's Ms. Hutchins? Um, I believe she's still in the, uh, uh, the care flight, the helicopter. And um, you saw the, the previous videos, uh, the, the video from Mr. Benavides. Do you recall seeing that? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and in that video, uh, did Ms. Gutierrez learn that Ms. Hutchins was critical but stable? Yes. That's all right. Just... Take a deep breath and we'll work this all out, okay? going to stand facing opposite, okay? okay? And Corporal, why do you need to uh, escort Ms. Gutierrez to the restroom? Uh, she had actually asked to be escorted by law enforcement, which is why I was with her. Um, we take it as a precaution to accompany people into the restroom um, just to, I guess, ensure um, that they don't harm themselves, that they're not trying to um, hide evidence, such things like that. <clears throat> You guys have a lot of people out here. Yeah. Is there like a closer cop car you guys can put me in or something? Um, I mean the closest one that I can put you in is one of the ones that's like the unmarked one. I just kind of wish that any of my coworkers could stop seeing me because I already feel super bad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hold on just one second. I can even throw you in mine. I have an unmarked one. Um, is it close? It's like right. It's, we walked through them. Okay, cool. Yeah, so. I just, I don't want to go back. Okay. I just want to get the fuck out of here and never show my face in this industry ever again. Well, I wouldn't say that. No, oh, I wouldn't. How long have you been uh, working here? <laughs> nah, just a month. Just a month? Yeah. I've just been doing this job for like nine months now. Okay. How old are you? 24. I'm like the only female armor in the game and I just fucked up my whole entire career. Have you uh, studied armory or did you go to classes or my how did you dad, get into it? My dad's the best, one of the best armors in the entire world and he trained me and I'm a fucking failure. Let's do it. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, so... It's these cars. Mine's actually the, the silver car car over here. Okay, my little fanny pack is right in front of that cop car on that thing, if we could bring it. Okay. Possibly. What's in it? Just my keys. My stuff. My ID. Okay. Um, yeah, let me just figure out. Let me sit you in here. You can just leave it, honestly. I just yeah, my inhaler is in it. Okay, do you my, need that? My inhaler might be in the back of the car. You know what? Let me... Sorry, we have so much gear. Is that like... I'm not sure. 
Do you want a Gatorade? It's not open. It's been I'm all right. Okay. So I'll leave that there if you want it. Okay. Do you want, oh, you can control the window. to hang out with you here though, okay, since my vehicle is... So, um, she doesn't want to be up in the cop car um, until they figure out transportation. We just let them know that I have her in here. She doesn't want to be... Hmm. This is the armor? Yeah. Okay. So you're just going to hang out with her here? Yeah. Not Until they figure out what they want to do. But yes. Okay. So she wants to be transported over there. Yeah, she not wants. To, car. Right. She, okay. she, exactly. And she just doesn't want to be. Stop seeing well, she doesn't want everybody to see her right now. Yeah. So she's. I have her back here. From New Mexico? No. Not a city. It's from Arizona. From Arizona? What part? Well, that city, Arizona. I actually don't think I know where that is. Let me know how the temperature is, okay? I can do whatever you need. Have you called your parents or anything yet? Gutierrez's request, did you take her to the restroom? Yes. And at her request, did you uh, permit her to sit in your patrol unit? Yes. Did you turn your patrol unit on so that she could be in a comfortable temperature? Yes. Did you allow her full use of her cell phone? Yes, I did. So just to be clear, Ms. Gutierrez's phone wasn't taken either, was it? No, it wasn't. And then later that day, did you do another interview with Ms. Gutierrez at the police station? Yes. We're going to turn it into evidence. Yes. Uh, we would move into evidence states exhibit 67 and ask for permission to publish. No objection. All right, state 67 is admitted. You may publish. And, uh, and Corporal, where did you go? 
Uh, I went to go get a um, a form which essentially has Miranda rights on them. And and who who's this lady in the room? This was the um, so her name is Samantha Talamante. She was a detective that I was interviewing with on that day. And does she still work at Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? Yes, yeah, she's a corporal as well right now. Thank you. Um, so right now it's uh, technically inside the scene, so we can't um, quite grab it yet. Okay, cool. But you said it's, it's black and gray? No, it's just the gray one. It's just gray, okay. And it was on the cart? Yeah. Yeah, so it'll be, it'll be secured and it'll be on the cart. Okay. Yeah. So I can cool. say this is the, the rights that I just need to go over and I'll read them to you as I do. If you understand them, you can. Uh, signature or check out here um, and then read the rest here and if you agree okay so you have the right to remain silent anything you say may be used against you in a court of law or other proceedings you have the right to consult an attorney before making any statements or answering any questions and you may have him or her present with you during questioning you may have an attorney appointed to you to represent you if you cannot afford one otherwise obtain, obtain one Okay. You understand those, and if you wish to, uh, I kind of with like an attorney. You kind of like. What do you want to do? Let's, I mean, just because the situation and everything, and their attorney already talked to me, and I just think I should probably have an attorney represent me. Okay, before you make any statements or talk to us. Do you know what attorney she's referring to? Uh, there was an attorney that was at the ranch, but I don't know her name. Okay. Uh, well, I can I can probably answer a few questions. I mean. So at any time, so I'm gonna again, you don't have to talk to us, and if you want to talk to your attorney, that's fine. If you want to answer some questions, um, you still have. You still could change your mind during this question, right. questioning. So it's up to you. If you want to talk to us and at some point you feel like maybe you want your attorney, you can't. But mm -hmm. you need to make the decision on what you want to do right now. If you want to talk to us. How long would it take when you get here, I guess? It's going to be you calling them and finding out. Really? Okay. Uh, I don't know. They're a fucking attorney. I don't know. It's just like such a big company, you know. Oh, you're talking about with the production company? Yeah. I don't want this, like, I don't want anything in this case to be fucked up for me as much as I possibly can. So, no, no you're fine. And it's, that's why we go with these. Yeah. So you know you're right. Okay. It's up to you. Um, Is there an attorney I can call? It would be a public defender. They might not, and they might advise another day. Uh, it's going to, it could go a longer process, I don't know. All right, I can answer some basic questions. If you if you want to answer some basic questions, we could do that, and then if you at some point feel like it's... Right on, yeah. yeah. And like I said, right now we are just interviewing you because you are... You were there. There, you were there. You totally. are in charge of yeah. the armor. Okay. So you're okay with talking with us? Yeah. So, I just ask, we'll start off with basic questions, okay? Okay. So, you've already mentioned that you've been on set for five months now? On this particular set? No, on this particular set, I've only been there two weeks. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, do you want the date and time? Oh, yeah, please. It's going to be um, 21. 21. 21. I'm so sorry. Um, how do you spell your first name? Hannah, H-A-L-L-A-H. And your last name? Gutierrez, G U T I E R R E Z. When's your date of birth? April 28th, 1997. April 28th, 97? Yeah. And how old are you? 24. <laughs> I just want you to be comfortable when you're talking about this, okay? Okay. So this set 
that you've been here for two weeks. Yes. Um, and this is your primary job is handling the armor. Yeah. Can you uh, go into detail about what you do? Um, I put check the guns and I load the guns and uh, I hand the guns off to the actor. Okay. Um, how long have you been doing this? Because you mentioned you've been on multiple sets. Um, since about March, but I've been handling guns my whole life pretty much. So you're very familiar with guns. Mm -hmm. And this is your primary function. You go to sets. different sets and you primarily handle these guns. Yeah. Okay. So can you tell us what happened today when you started work, when you got there to work? Um, yeah, I uh, went to work. We got the guns out. Uh, Who's we? Me, uh, my coworker Sarah. She helps me with the guns a little bit too. Um, yeah. And uh, we got the guns out. We went to set. We had the guns on set. Uh, I dummied the guns up with the dummy rounds. And yeah, we were on set all day. No, nothing happened. And then we came back from lunch and uh, that happened. So you got on set with the gun, with the dummy rounds about what, oh, what, what time? Like 7.30 probably. Around 7.30 this morning? Yeah. I didn't dummy the gun up until about a little before lunch, like an hour before lunch. Corporal, could you understand what Ms. Gutierrez said about something about the gun? Did she say dummy the gun up? Yeah, she had um, said that she dummied the gun up right before lunch. Okay. And we take all the guns and we lock them up for lunch. So yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. You and Sarah, what's her last name, do you know? Sarah's last name. I don't think she really worked with that gun that day, by the way. Um, but there's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-R-Y. Okay. So just to be clear, did Ms. Gutierrez just tell you that Ms. Zachary didn't really work with the Baldwin gun that day? That's correct. But she was there today with you, helping you today, correct? Yeah. Okay. So you and Sarah, who has access to that? So when you got there this morning, where are the guns kept? The uh, guns are kept on the prop truck. On the prop truck? And yeah, and the dummies and everything kept on the prop truck. Are the dummy rounds separate, contained, than the gun? All yeah. in the truck? Yeah, yeah, they're in their own box, and the guns are in the safe. Okay. And who has access to the safe? Sarah and I. Just the two of you? Yes. Okay. So what about the dummy rounds? Who has access to that? Well, the dummy rounds, they were on the the cart for lunch. Um, yeah, the dummy rounds were on the cart for lunch. All the ammo was on the cart for lunch. Is there, if you're saying dummy rounds and ammo, are there two separate things? Um, so there's blanks, my bad, not ammo, but there's blanks, you know, uh, the blanks look different. They shoot the stuff, and the dummies normally just have a little BB in them. Okay. What is the purpose for the dummy rounds? Because you were loading those up this morning. So first. the dummy rounds, they're meant to, uh, they're meant to put in like the belts of the cowboys and everything. And uh, like in the revolver, you can see the if it's empty or not. So yeah, I have to dummy them up if they're gonna be like looking right at the camera. Oh, okay, so you just for show the dummy rounds are just for show to make it look just as for full. Show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then the other rounds that you like the other round, seen, Yeah, the other rounds. Beat. Yeah. They don't shoot a BB. No. no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. They just shoot like they just open up and a little black powder comes out and that's okay. all. It's just a little black powder and yeah. Is there live ammo that's kept on set? No. Never. Okay. So I hardly even go shooting with 45 ammo at all. I normally just use 22. Okay. So. And so you 
you got the guns this morning, you and Sarah are the only ones who have, is it a combination for the safe? It is, yeah. Okay, and you guys are the only ones who have that combination? Mm -hmm. Okay. But the rounds are? They're in the truck, yeah. The truck gets pretty much locked up every night. I mean, okay. not like padlocked, but just on set security. Okay. Um, or do you guys have lunch? Does a lot of people just eat lunch there? Uh, we all leave and we go back to base camp. Okay. And you guys left the dummy rounds and the ammo, but it's not real ammo. My bad. Blanks. The blanks. Yeah, we'll go with blanks. I'll, I'll use blanks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, just so I also don't mix up in the confusion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> when you got the dummy rounds and the blanks this morning, what were you guys doing before lunch? Was that just... We were just... Uh, with the dummies only, just... Yeah, just the dummies. We were we were just about to get into the blank stuff, and you know, like part of my job is checking the barrel to make sure nothing's in it, because that's how Brandon Lee died. That, you know. Yeah, yeah, Brandon. So like that's what I checked for. I definitely checked this morning, and I was planning on checking again right after lunch, before we got into all the shits, and I already started checking uh, the other two guns to check in the in the thing for them, and none of them had any barrel obstructions. So, yeah. So you check the gun, but do you check the blanks and the dummies as well? I do check the dummies. I check all of them, and they all they all showed that they were not hot. I guess you could say. How how can you tell the difference on um, the ammo on the dummy rounds or the blanks? I'm sorry, I'm sorry wrong dummy. How can you tell the difference from the blanks and live, real am ammunition? A little ring. Like there's a little ring in there. It just rings. It rattles. It's like a little rattle. When it's a blank? Yeah. And then also there's ones that I have with holes in the side to show that there's nothing in them. Okay. So what are these ones? They're the rings? Yeah. These ones were the rings. There was one, I think, with a hole. Yeah. So I want to visit with you a little bit about Ms. Gutierrez's statements up to this point. Um, initially, Ms. Gutierrez told you that she shook all the dummy rounds, is that right? Yes. And then uh, upon further questioning, did Ms. Gutierrez tell you that, uh, in fact, um, one of the rounds actually wouldn't have been a shaker, it, it had a hole in the side. Correct, which wouldn't give any sort of audible noise if she shook it. All right. Um, you put the gun before going to lunch back in the safe. Yeah. But the blanks and dummies were left on the cart. Yeah. Did you, when you got back, were they did they look moved or tampered with or touched when you got back from lunch? They did not. No, nothing Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Okay. Was the gun still in the safe after lunch? Yeah. Who pulled left? it out? Uh, Sarah pulled it out and she handed it to me. Okay. Yeah. Then you watched her? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to get with is because they... You can handle the gun, you obviously are going to be loading the gun, so that's mm -hmm. why I'm concerned about the dummy and the blank because those were left out. And if I, mm -hmm. is there some way that somebody can alter them to make them still look like your dummy rounds? Well, so that's the thing is that like bullets, like real bullets, pretty much look the same mm -hmm. as dummies. The only difference is the rattle. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, that could, that's a choice, but also, um, I don't know, I'm kind of wondering, because I heard back in the day, dummies used to have, like, a primer cap, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if maybe it was one of those older ones, or something like that. Did you load them after lunch? They were already loaded from before lunch. Okay. And so that's the thing, is like, you know, we had that gun the whole time before that, and it was 
nothing happened and I wasn't in there and they weren't supposed to be even pulling the hammer back. So, okay, um, all right, let me just yeah. clarify a little bit. So prior to lunch, the guns, you had them out? Yeah. And where were they when they were out? They were inside with all the camera crew and everything. It's, you know, COVID, everything happening right now. They don't really like a lot of people in there. Okay. And so usually I'm, like, hardly allowed in there unless there's actual firing happening. Okay. Yeah. Did, were you inside this morning? Uh, I walked in there and I handed the gun to Alex a couple of times, and Alex took it, and everyone was there with him. Alex? Alex. Okay. Baldwin, yeah. Baldwin? Okay, so you handed him the gun this morning. Yeah. Um, does he pass it off to anybody? He, Are we able to see that? At one point, Dave had it, uh, the assistant director, but he was just sitting in with it, and then I saw him, and I was like, okay, this is fine. He's just sitting in, and then I walked out, and yeah. And how do you know that Dave had it? I handed it off to Dave while he was sitting in for the shot. Okay. Um... All right, so you guys were the only three handlers prior to lunch? Alec, uh, Dave, me. Dave was after lunch. Okay. Dave was after lunch. Um, yeah, that should have been the only ones. Um, maybe Sarah, possibly, but, yeah. Um, Cause they, the thing they, just, they chill on our little table, and we're pretty much there all the time. Okay. And then, so prior to lunch, should they do any um, scenes or anything of the sort where they were firing the weapon? No. Okay. Not just just for handling. Lunch. Yeah, we were just supposed to get into it right after that. Like, literally, that was the last shot before we actually got into blanks. Okay. And those blanks were already loaded in before lunch? No, the okay. blanks are different than dummies. So, that's, yeah. yeah, blanks, totally different. They actually have, like, ignition and powder and everything. Dummies, no powder, just for looks. Just for looks, right. Yeah. So, that, yeah, so I think everything was after lunch then. So, mm -hmm. after lunch, you get back, and that's when you loaded a dummy round. I mean, the blanks. No, 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 no blanks were loaded. No, like all of me today. Yeah, no, okay. no blanks were loaded today. I was like getting ready for it. I had my fanny packs like full of like blanks and everything. But okay. So when was the last time you loaded it? No, I loaded it with the with the. So I loaded it with five of the dummy rounds before lunch, and there was one that wouldn't go in. And so when we got back from lunch, I took the like little cleaner guy. I cleaned it out really quick and I put another dummy in there. Okay, so there are five total in the gun. Yeah. Can you um, About describe? Six. There was six. Total. Six. Five, yeah. Okay. When the incident occurred, yeah, there was six. Okay. Can you describe the gun? Uh, it's a Colt. It's a long barrel Colt. It's a long barrel? Mm hmm. And six rounds fit in it? Yeah. What color? A brown. It's bronze? Yeah, they're bronze. Yeah, kind of bronze, brassy. What, uh, caliber? It's a your eyes. Okay. And that was the only one that was used today? No, the other two were used too. Okay. What yeah. do those look like? Uh, da, 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 da. those are both 45. I think they're either Colts or U Birdies, um, 45, and yeah, the two other characters had them. Okay. And they're revolver looking? Yeah, they are revolvers. But the long barrel was the one that was used during the incident, just to be clear. Yes, yeah. the long barrel one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other two were on the actors, and those were fine. Okay, so they're kind of like for show, pretty much, you know, our holsters? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, they took them out and they had them on camera, too. And yeah. Okay. Um, do you know, what time did you go to lunch? 
say about 1230, pretty much on the dot. And then, so after that, Sarah pulled him out. Yeah. Did she, did yeah. you see her um, check them or did she just hand them to you and that's when you checked them out? She just handed us, we all took them, we took them in the bag to the set, so we didn't check them there. They're in little, like, socks, little socks. Okay. Yeah. What do those look like? Little socks. They look like socks. <laughs> All right. Yeah. They, uh, they honestly look like socks. Yeah. Okay. And so when you checked it, it was on set? Or prior mm -hmm. to you checked yeah, it? Yeah, it was on set. Um, I didn't really check it too much after lunch, you know, because because it was already locked up and everything at lunch. But yeah, I checked it and uh, put in that last round and sent it in. Okay. Yeah. I know that you had said something about um, keeping stuff in your fanny pack. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's a little fanny pack. It's super, it has a lot of pockets, so it's really cool to, like, separate, like, you know, the, the dummies from the blanks, but it's mostly to separate like the blank sizes because there's quarter loads, there's half loads, and then there's full loads. And I usually don't keep any full loads out there unless I need them, um, but uh, I usually keep quarter loads and half loads right here. So if it's close up to an actor, we use a, half, a quarter load, and if it's farther away from an actor, we go ahead and we use halves. Okay. So what's the reasoning for that? Uh, just uh, the halves have more smoke and they look more real. Okay. Yeah. So pretty much for... Like if it was a bigger gun, like a rifle or something. Yeah. So you keep or if it's outdoors, you know. But mostly it's the quarters just in case they're closer proximity to an actor, you know. Or if it's inside quarters. Or if it's around an animal or a child quarters. Okay. And then you had said um, that they're only supposed to pretty much expel dust or smoke, right? Yes. Okay. Um, were you inside when the incident occurred? No. I was right outside by my, uh, uh, what do you call it, my uh, cart. Okay. How close was it? Uh, about 20, no, 15, 15, 20 feet from being inside. Okay. What side of the building was done? Uh, Building like the door is facing. I don't know my north and west. So is it where the cross is? <coughs> I think that was the main door. So um, our where our cars were? Where the where the door where they were like coming in and everything. That door we were like right adjacent to that to the left. Okay. Could you yeah. see inside at all? No, not really. Um, no, I couldn't see inside. What do you remember about? Basically, I just like, you know, we had a couple of, uh, like we had a popper pop last week. You know, the poppers are for special effects. Like one just went off randomly last week. So I was like, oh, it must be a popper. And like, you know, I checked all of them myself. So I heard like the shot and I was, and Sarah was like, what was that? And I was like, must have been a popper. And I like turned around. And then I heard them say medic emergency. And I was like, what the fuck? And then I like checked in and I like looked and I saw Alec on the ground and I was like, oh, not Alec, uh, Joel. And I was like, what the fuck, was it the gun? And Dave was like, yeah, it was a fucking gun. And so I was like, I walked in and I like tried to see what was happening or like where the gun was, you know, to secure the weapons on the set. And I got yelled at. Um, and I ran out, and Dave brought me the gun, and I opened the gun up, and one of the dummies somehow had been discharged. And can you kind of explain a little bit more what you mean by that uh, it was discharged? So when, if I had a bullet, oh, wait, I have some dummies. So. Right, check these out. Ugh, I wish it had just been one of these. Fuck. Um, but see how these have like the whole. Okay. You know, this one doesn't have a primer, right? Okay. And most of them, like, they have like the primers, but the primers aren't like hot. Like, I've never had one with a hot primer before. Okay. 
So that seems pretty weird to me. Um, but so basically this part, when a bullet shoots, the fire projects it and this comes out, this little piece right here, this little nipple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so when I had checked the gun, this part, that was gone. Did you get to see the shell? I saw the shell, yeah, and it's on the, it's on the thing. Did it have one of the... Did it look like this, or was it different? It looked, it wasn't, it didn't have the hole, it didn't have that. So, I mean, it had that, and it didn't have the hole. Um, and this was gone, so it was just the shell. So it kind of looked just a cartridge. Just the regular, like, cartridge when it was shot. Yeah. So these ones are dummy or because they have the hole. Yeah. So that one didn't have a hole. So it looked like a realistic yeah. one when you saw it. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about your, but a lot of what about your blank? What about them? Do they, what's the difference between a blank and that? You know, I don't think I could show you, but uh, the blank is very different. Um, and you would absolutely be able to tell the difference just by looking at it. Uh, so basically, the end here where this is gone, uh, the projectile is gone in the blanks basically. This is squeezed shut. Like, you know, it's filled with like a little bit of gunpowder. Like I said, either quarter, half load, or full load. Filled with a little bit of black powder. And it's opened by the metal part just going so okay. just so nothing flies out of those. Okay. So this is pretty much what looked like what was in the gun. This is 100% what was in the gun. Except without that. Okay. And with the primer, but the primer normally is on there anyways for a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. So it's not as well. No, it's not. A lot of them are, a lot of them have the primer so that way you can like see them in the belt and they look real. Okay. But a lot of them also have the primer in a hole and that one didn't have a hole. All right. So you had said when, who, so how did you end up getting the gun after? Um, I went in there, they yelled at me, I ran out, and I was like, can I see the gun? And they brought me the gun, and I opened it, and checked it, and the very first one that I liked, because, you know, once you shoot it, the next one in a revolver, it'll be that one, and the first one I pulled out, didn't have that. Okay. Did you get to see any of the others? Uh, the others all had, yeah, I took them all out was there on the cart, too. They all had rings, and they all had holes, and I don't understand. But that one did not. And Corporal, just to be clear, the live rounds that were found on set, none of them rattled, did they? No, they didn't rattle. And none of them had holes in the side, did they? No. And, I'm sorry, explain again what the ring is? So, imagine if this. Oh. Oh, okay. So just a noise. So that's what I'm saying. So this one is exactly what it looked like was in there. Okay. And that one doesn't have any holes. So that's, um, yeah. Um, honestly, that box of dummies might have some wonky ones in it. And we got that, I think, a week ago. Who ordered them? Um, well, we got them from our, like, from Seth are like supplier and everything. Okay. But Seth borrowed them from someone. I don't know who. Borrowed the runs that you have? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And how do you know he borrowed them? I don't know. Uh, that's what Sarah said. And then as soon as Sarah called Seth, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what, if she talked to him or anything about this. Okay. You mean today, if she called him today and already talked to him? Or when? I, ha I don't uh, Corporal, based on your investigation, well, let me back up. I, I think that we heard uh, Ms. Gutierrez um, testify that that box of dummies might have had some wonky ones in it. Is, it, is that right? Yes. And did she also testify that that box was provided about a week earlier by Mr. Kinney? Yes. And. Did you continue to investigate 
uh, the, the box and the source of that box of dummies. Yes. Based on your investigation, uh, was Ms. Gutierrez's assertion that that box came from Mr. Kenny a week earlier, did, was that assertion correct? No, it wasn't. I know she called him, but I didn't get to hear the police officer told her to stop talking to me. So I don't really know what happened with that. Um, but yeah, so. Okay. Um, are you aware of a time or know if something like that can be dysfunctional or? I mean, you know, like overall, these are some weird, like what we're dealing with are like, you know, explosives. It is, there's always like a chance of like, you know, safety to be compromised and that's the issue and that's what I'm supposed to watch out for on set and yeah. Okay. Uh, what did Ms. Gutierrez just say? What she's supposed to watch out for on set? Uh, the ammunition, pretty much. I'm going to back it up just a few seconds. Anything about this? Okay. You mean today, if she called him today or not, or talked to him, or when? I, I don't. I know she called him, but I didn't get to hear the police officer told her to stop talking to me. Okay. So I don't really know what happened with that. Um, but yeah, so. Okay. Um, are you aware of a time or know if something like that can be dysfunctional or? I mean, you know, like overall, these are some weird, like what we're dealing with are like, you know, explosives. It is, there's always like a chance of like, you know, safety to be compromised and that's the issue. And that's what I'm supposed to watch out for on set and yeah. But um, I've never really heard of, I've heard of blanks before with the primer, you know, that's the only time I've ever heard of them, which is why I'm wondering if it was kind of one of the older ones, because that kind of stopped after that whole Brandon Lee situation. But I'm not really sure. So if Steph orders all of your rounds, yeah. and is there anybody else that's involved in that? Um, I can't really say. Okay. I just get what I get, and I'm told not to visit it. Um, yeah. Do you know who the manufacturer is of this? No. Do you know what the box looks like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, the box is on the cart. Okay. It says, dummy around. Okay. Yeah. What? Corporal. Did Ms. Gutierrez just tell you where you could find the box of dummy rounds that she was pulling from? Yeah, she said it was on the cart. Okay. And, and, and is that consistent with what you saw in Mr. Benavides's video? Um, in his lapel video, she grabbed them from the cart, however, handed them directly to Lieutenant Benavides. Okay, so somewhat consistent. Yes. What do you know about that? That that's Seth is, uh, he's um, had armor on for The Walking Dead. Okay. He was on that show for 10 years. But he's also familiar about yeah. getting these. Yeah, Seth is, mm, like, yeah, he pretty much is teaching me everything other than my father. <laughs> Has anyone ever allowed live ammo on set? No one. Okay. What's your guys' protocol for the ammo? Protocol. Um, like, what do you have in place? You know, are you supposed to check them every day? Um, basically, basically, like, you know, our protocol for the ammo is, like, you know, I have to know load sizes. I have to know, like, who's in the proximity, if it's a child, if it's a horse. 
Um, and my protocol really is a lot of checking for barrel obstructions, mostly because that's where a lot of mistakes get made, is like just a blank behind something, and a lot of guns get thrown into, like, dropped in rocks, you know, and rocks get into the barrel and fly out and shit. So my shit is mostly just checking the barrel and everything and then making sure the dummies are dummies. Yeah, and I've never really had any that didn't sound like dummies. Okay. When you looked at the gun, when he Dave brought it back to you after the incident, did it look like it was the same gun when you handed it to Dave? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, I would be able to tell, too, by the circling markings on the bottom of it. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember what those markings are? Um, they're kind of like...
She was another person that was in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do I have Helena, Joel? Do you know Joel's last name? Joel uh, Olds. Joel Olds. S O U Z A. Okay. Alec, Dave, anybody else inside? Um, well, her first, her study cam operator was inside. His name is Reed Russell. R E I D R U S S E L. He's a camera guy. Okay. So, you want to go to the other Um, I she can think of. She was Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not thing about this just because, it, and I don't care about north or that, but. So, where we were parked here at the back of the church, that was where the front. The car is. Where you were parked? Yeah, we were parked over here. So the church across the main entrance to that would have been over here. We were parked okay, over here. Okay, yeah, yeah. Where was your car? Because I don't think there was doors here or on this side of the building. So there was a door here. Okay. And my car was approximately over here by a little black tent. Where okay. the producers or second cast or anyone would show under, really. Okay, and then that door's over here. So can you can... Can you see the front, that door, from where you were standing? Yeah. And you could see Dave the whole time on his way. On his way. Corporal, did Ms. Gutierrez indicate that the prop cart uh, during the incident was located over by the black tent? Yes. And was that the exact same spot where it was when Mr. Halls took Mr. Benavides over to the cart to look for the gun. Yes. Hey. To, could you, you well, no, no I, I went inside him. to hand him the gun. Oh, he, he was sitting, he was him. standing in pretty much. Oh, okay, so you, you didn't just hand it and then he walked off. And no, away. yeah, so you I handed it to Dave with the camera people there. Okay. So you were close to the door when you handed it. I was in, I was inside for a second, and then I went back out because, yeah. They tell you to get out. Yeah. Okay, pretty much. I'm just curious because of the whole transferring from one person to another, the gun. Yeah. Um, so he, he is the one who gives it directly to Alec. Um, here's a picture, um, and I just want to see if this is something that would have come out of one of these. Totally. It wouldn't be a, li a real... Real life. Let me pause there for a moment. Um, what is Detective Talamante, or now rather Corporal Talamante, uh, showing Ms. Gutierrez on her phone? So we had um, received a photo from the deputy that was at the hospital with Joel Souza. Um, he had sent us a photograph of the projectile that was removed from his shoulder um, inside a little like plastic canister essentially that the hospital staff had put it in. Um, I'm not going to put this up on the monitor because I think everybody can see it. I'm showing you what's already been entered as States Exhibit 54. Uh, is this a photograph of what, is this what was in that photograph? Yes. Okay. Uh, just the projectile. It, yeah, inside of a little container, though. Okay. And, and, and this was just a photograph that a detective at the hospital took of the projectile inside the container and texted. Uh, I don't believe it was a detective that was there. It was just a deputy that... I'm um, sorry. Yeah, that was instructed to go to the hospital with Joel Souza. All right. kind of this little line right there, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure the regular ones don't. Okay. So that... Detective, uh, are you now relatively familiar with blank rounds? Yes. Do blank rounds look at anything like that projectile? No. It looks like that would be in the blanks all the time. That was what was pulled out of the shoulder. 
Oh my God, poor Helena. So that's why they were thinking it could be an actual live round at this point. Really? Yeah. Does that look like it would have been a live round to you? Well, honestly, if we had my extractor, we could pull this out and check it. But um, I don't know. Actually, it's so cool. Yeah, I don't know because look at that line. That's kind of a distinct thing. That's. I think that's mostly for dummies. Just to be clear, was Ms. Gutierrez offering to use a device to disassemble a round? Yes. Did she do that? Uh, no, we couldn't. I could not find a tool at the, at the sheriff's office that we could use to do that. But did she indicate to you that she had one? Uh, yes. But just not on her? Correct. All right. A regular live round, though. It looks pretty. That's what they were thinking. It could be a live round. Um, Holy fuck! Mm -hmm. I I just think you said, and I and I think that's why there's protocol because of Lee when all that happened on set too. Was there anything that stuck out of ordinary today to you? No, I mean, just the whole camera crew quit, that's all. So we were like super behind and everything. That's when did the camera crew quit? Uh, yesterday. So is there a reason? I don't know. Okay, um, I don't, I don't think that they would be involved in that. Well, one. yeah. is there because maybe people were disgruntled? Oh, there was definitely some bickering, but I don't, yeah, I, I highly doubt that they were able to switch any rounds, and especially getting a 45 round is, like, stupid hard right now, mm -hmm. and at least, yeah. Was there any of that towards Joel, or did anybody have any issues with uh, Joel, and what was the other one? Named? I don't believe anyone had issues with Joel. Okay. Um, Helena. Helena. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't know too much about her. She's definitely a strong personality, that's all. Mm -hmm. But there's nobody that you could think of that might have any Can I say anger. I couldn't really say that anyone would be, like, that angry. Like, you know, we're on a film set. Everybody's always pissed off at each other a little bit together for 12 hours a day, five days a week, you know? Yeah. It's hard not for, it's hard to not beef with people a little bit. Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting that the whole camera crew quit yesterday and then that is pretty something funny. happens like this today. Would somebody want to maybe, uh, or they could even have an issue without, if somebody wants to disrupt the filming of this movie, mm -hmm. is that I don't something that you could? think of? I don't know. I can't really say for sure. And I wouldn't want to think that about anybody on that set personally. You really don't want to think that about anybody. Never. But no. really... Yeah, I can't think of like any one person. I couldn't really think of a situation that would require like, you know, I don't know, almost killing somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it happened. I mean, yeah. you keep mentioning it was left to crow when that happened. Yeah, that was scary, so, man. These things happen when These somebody. Things, I know. I can't believe I'm like the last thing like this to happen since the crow. And my own un fucking worst Apparently. Well, I think right now they're good, but I've seen that's why, unfortunately, you were that they're that way. It's like, oh, it's the person who. Yeah. Who is in charge of all these? Totally. And that's why we wanted to talk to you. Was one yeah. of the main ones because yeah, you're in charge of it, but that's that's also why would you put yourself in that predicament? Yeah. You know. So would it be possible? Yeah, I don't know. I think I think maybe there was just perhaps a bad round in that box. Well, a couple of bad, bad rounds. Possibly. Because there wasn't one round that went off. What? There was one, right? How did Cause the two people get shot? No, so there was only one round that went off, and oh. I must have went through Joel somehow and fucking hit Helena, and I'm like flabbergasted mm -hmm. by this. Um, I can't fucking imagine how that happened, but I heard one shot. Okay. 
Yeah, I heard one shot, and honestly, like, I opened up the gun, I checked the rest of them, only one of these was gone, and the rest were fine. Mm-hmm. I wish we could. This one has a different top than this one. This one that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, they're all, I mean, like, you know, they all kind of vary a little bit. That's just the thing about them. They all vary a little bit. Um, yeah. Tell me about what happened yesterday. Did something happen, or did they just walk off set? I have no idea. I think at the end of the night, they all quit. Um, uh, the camera crew always bickered a lot, to be honest. Like, a lot of... I don't know, just animosity, I guess, or them with the grits, uh, everybody, yeah, that whole, it's almost unpleasant to be inside there, just because it's so, like, toxic, yeah, so, COVID, yeah, I tried to stay out, and then I was definitely on the sides watching, and they weren't supposed to be pulling the hammer back or anything, like, it was just supposed to be in the shot. And so I don't know why yeah. it was pulled back. I don't know what, yeah. I mean, if if they wanted it pulled back, like, that's fine. I, I had no idea about it, you know. But, but even then, it's going to have gone on. Yeah, so that's why I was all like, I was like, okay, like, it's right there, you know. I stand right by whenever there's gunfire. I'm still there whenever the shit's there, but I'm not usually directly inside the room just because they don't find it necessary. Yeah. Well, and that's why it's like they're not supposed to pull the hammer back, but it still is a prop gun or a prop. It's a real gun. It's a real, a real gun, fucking gun. Your prop. Yeah. Set. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, totally. I know. Um, I just. I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. Is there anything that you think could have happened? I have that no idea. I kind of. I don't know. Uh, like I said, that box is shown there for lunch. Uh, I will say it is hard to get 45 ammo. You know, ammo is super expensive right now, and ever since the election, pretty much all ammo has been, like, bought up a ton. I'm sure you guys know it's a police force. Yeah. So I was just thinking you had mentioned when you were loading, dumbing it up, one of the rounds, one of the six rounds didn't fit in, correct? And you had to clean it. Yeah. Did that feel, seem odd to you? Mm-hmm. No, no, that didn't really seem that odd. That gun had been dropped a lot in the dirt previous before that. Um, yeah. So it might have just been a little gunky. And then after I cleaned it out, like, it fit right in. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah. Does that usually happen? Does that usually happen? Um, I mean, every now and then. Every now and then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You didn't think it, that it could have been the round itself that was the reason why it was initially given? You know, I don't think so because, like, these are dummies and everything, and they slide out a little easier, per se. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that that would have been a thing. Sometimes they do just get stuck because, like, the guns are a little dirty. Corporal, did Ms. Gutierrez uh, just indicate that the dummies slide in and out of the cylinder a little easier than live rounds? Yes. And she also indicated that that last round uh, didn't want to go in as easily. Is that correct? Yes. That sixth round that she put in after lunch? That's correct. Other than that, everything else seemed normal with the round. Everything else seemed status quo, and I thought today was going to be another like super great day, and that we were done shooting after this, and this can be smooth sailing. <laughs> so, did you the round that I showed you? Do you think it could have been from the the dummies? Yeah. Honestly, I'm not. I can't remember. I can't remember really if I got. Um, if they were from the box or if they were from uh, on on top of the 
we have a cart, you know, mm -hmm. and we have several dummies just around. Some come out of the box, some are, but they're all out of boxes, really, like, you know. But yeah, um, might have just been one of the ones on the cart. But it should be, yeah. And that's your cart. Nobody else puts anything else on it. Not really. I mean, you know. But it is possible. It is possible. And a lot of people have access to your car. Yeah. So, as you're loading it, do you... Corporal, at this point in time, were you aware that there were actually six live rounds on set? No. So, at this point in time, all you knew of was the one that resulted in the injuries, is that correct? That's correct. <laughs> And check every single time? Yeah. Every round? Yeah. And you did it on this time, too? I did it. Okay. But that one round, it, you weren't sure if it was fresh out of the box or just laying on the cart? Honestly, I don't think, like, if it didn't rattle, I want to help put it in. Okay. And so you heard the rattle? Okay. Yeah, I checked all, all six of them for a rattle. I hate to belabor the point, but she indicated she checked all six of them for a rattle, but one of them didn't have a BB in it, right? That's correct. Um, one of the rounds that Hannah had loaded in that firearm actually had a hole in the side of it to indicate it was a dummy, so it would not have rattled, which is contrary to her statement of if it wouldn't have rattled, I wouldn't have put it in. And. The live rounds wouldn't have rattled, rattled, correct? No, they won't. All right. We're almost done with this one. I just really, I mean, this I guess sometimes happen, but just that the whole crew quit the table for and then something like this happens. I, I don't know. I totally feel like this was just a fucking really fucked up accident. That's how you feel? Yeah. I wouldn't think that anyone on that phone set is that malicious. I mean, I just have to ask you. Yeah, no, because totally. it is something. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. What about Sarah? How much do you know about her? How long have you worked with her? She's like the nicest little Christian girl ever. Okay. We're going to have an extractor in an armor. So, an extractor? Yeah. For those? Yeah. So, I'm going to take. Okay, then. Want to be yeah. real quick, okay? Totally. Okay. I'll be back in just a minute. And so, just to be clear, the one that you had seen, that you had pulled out, looks like which one? Um, let's see. Like that one. Okay. With the, yeah. yeah, except when I saw it, it was punctured. So, not, it wasn't the missing it. When I, when I took it out, yeah, it was punctured, so. Unless you have anything else that you think you missed or want to add. I am going to hold on to these, okay? Actually, I'm going to hold on to these. Okay. okay. Um, just one more clarification. Um, when you got the gun back handed to you, had someone already opened it too, or you did all the manipulating of it? We did all the man manipulating so of it. They just literally just handed you the gun. Handed it to me. And yeah. it was still closed. It was still closed. Okay. That's the end of it. Would the court like to take the afternoon break? All right. We're going to take our afternoon break. Please don't stop coming yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Follow the bailiffs. All rise. All right, you may be seated. Council, approach.
All right, you may be seated. Okay, jurors, you may notice some new props at council table. Somebody hold up one of their props. They begged me, so I said okay. But if anybody spills it, they don't get another one. So, in fairness to you all, if you want to bring in some coffee, you may do, oh look at that. You, <laughs> you may do so, okay? Do you all do you all have uh, uh, cups with lids? There are lids in there. Um, okay. I'll just have to pull them out of the cabinet. Yeah. Okay, that'd be great because this trial is long, and you know, it's it's warm in here. No, she had a coat on before. It's because she, in here. <laughs> anyway, so so I think that's helpful to you all because I think that. You know, especially after lunch, I think that you know some of us are like, "Wow, it's quite a heavy meal I just had." So, mm -hmm. all right, now for you press. I'll let you do it too, but just behave. And if you spill it, you're completely out of here. No, I'm kidding. Um, but just okay, because you know it stains the rug. So, as we all know, all right. So I have, we have a jury question. Okay, jury question. Sure. Can we have closed captions for video testimony? Okay, so here's the situation. You'll remember that it was redacted. So um, we, you, well, first of all, no. The answer is no. They do have some transcriptions, but they have the transcription of the whole thing, of the whole uh, interview, and they've redacted some of it. So that's not going to work. However, we did. Um, uh, um, Brian mentioned that you all had some. You know, somebody said that you're having difficulties so on um, on listening to all of it or, or interpreting all of it. So what we're going to do is she's just going to stop from time to time and ask her to repeat what she what was heard or what was said. Okay. Now, if you really feel like you missed something and and Ms. Morrissey or Mr. Bowles aren't asking the witness what was what was said, what was said, raise your hand. Don't be shy. Okay. Because if you'd have told us, we could have done that in the other video too and we want you to hear as much as you can in the, the courtroom and then of course you can always uh, replay it when you're deliberating okay all right thank you uh, corporal throughout your investigation was it your understanding that the rounds that were taken out of the gun after the shooting were left on the prop cart? That was my understanding because of the statement Hannah had made um, that when she went to check that weapon to see what was inside of it, that she did it over that prop cart. Okay, and um, along those lines, where was the spent casing that we've now heard testimony uh, was fired from this gun. Where was that spent casing found? It was on top of the prop cart. Okay. Um, so we are going to let me get the exhibit number. I apologize. Okay, we are now going to play um, State's Exhibit 68. Uh, and and just for clarification, uh, can you see on your screen what we're looking at? Yes. Uh, so we understand that the first video was of the statement on October 21st. What date is this interview taking place? This is November 9th, 2021. Um, I would ask to admit State's Exhibit 68 and permission to publish.
No objection. Yes, admitted. You may publish. hard to fine tune it. Um, let me let me see if I can make it better from here, George, and if I can't, we'll push it down one up there. Yeah. Um, sure, this is seeing. Um, I'm actually primary on this. Okay. I need to go up a little. Up a little? Okay. Yeah. Let's try it there and see if I can get the okay. I told you how you got to that. What do you think you want to do? kind of like out of it. I can't tell yeah. what this Ooh, means. I think everybody was a little bit that day. Yeah. Um, so it's formality. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. I noticed that this microphone's on. I'm going to turn off that because it needs to do with it. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we can turn off more of these microphones and prevent some of that. Is that one on over there? Um, no? Okay. All right, let's mine's see. Mine's on, and I can turn it off, and I think, Corporal, you can turn yours off as long as you remember to turn it back on when we're talking. Okay. <clears throat> but remember. Okay, so can you tell me your years of experience as an armor? Okay, 
So pretty much um, mostly really started taking on this armor job in March with my dad. Uh, we did the movie Murder at Immigrant Gulch together uh, on the same team. I was his assistant. And then I did my own uh, did my own job as head armor on the old way after that. Uh, and then after that, um, I did this, you know. And before that, I had gone on a couple of things with my dad, mostly doing production assistant work, but also still kind of watching him and still kind of learning from him on the side. Okay. Yeah. So I did Magnificent Seven, like, back in 2015, and we were out there for, like, two months, and I was learning a lot from him then, too. Okay. So pretty much just assisting him. Yeah. From 2015 until... Yeah, pretty much. It's just, and also, well, not like consistently either because I was in college for a lot of that time. Okay. Yeah. So for a lot of before this, I was in college, so not really able to do the whole film set thing. Okay. What did you go to college for? Uh, I went to college for communications and film. Okay. Yeah, and I also took a lot of art classes too. So how many uh, productions now do you have under your belt? Um... Tenuma, uh, what do you call it? About seven. Seven. Seven, yeah. And then also I did a bunch in college, you know. And then how many with you as head armor? Head armor, just two. Okay. Yeah. So that was the... This, the rest, way. and the old way, yeah. Okay. Um, how long did you spend on the old way? We did that for a month and a week. Oh, so it's like not that much time. Not that much time. I know. Mm -hmm. But it was only me doing the guns on it. So it was me, 22 guns, doing all of the loading and everything myself. Okay. Um, what about any official training that you've done? In the uh, official two? training? Uh, not really much official training. So just I was planning on getting my... Uh, my uh, concealed carry permit uh, pretty soon, but haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Um, for what you do as an armorer, does this job require to use like specific tools when you're doing inspections on weapons? Uh, so I don't really do the inspections on weapons too much. I'm not a gunsmith by any means, you know. Um, I get them from Seth. Seth like, you know, maintenance them and everything. I was cleaning a couple of them, and a couple of them did have some issues that I couldn't figure out, so I sent them back to Seth, and he sent them back to me, and they were okay. Okay. So any type of, like, malfunction or anything that you came across would go? Yeah. And yeah. you're talking about Seth Kenny, right? Yeah. Okay. And I sent back one of the guns because the hammer was pulled back, and it wouldn't released back down and I don't know he said something about I cleaned it wrong or something I'm not sure but I cleaned 17 other pistols that day so I don't know how I did that one wrong okay do you remember which one that was uh you know that was actually one of Miller's guns and not related to the incident really but uh Miller was one of the deputies and just one of his, the hammer got stuck back, and I've never encountered that before, so okay. went ahead and sent it back. Okay. <clears throat> um, so as far as, like, the movie productions go, do they require you to have any certifications to work? And it can be, like, you know, anything. I'm not really sure entirely, um, just because... Most of the jobs I've gotten have just been, like, through word of mouth and everything, or, like, you know, Seth works on getting them for me, or my dad gets them for me, or my dad got me on as his assistant the first time, you know, so I'm not really sure entirely what they are looking for. I know that they get a firearms license and everything, and a license for the area to shoot on and everything, um, but they usually get that. I don't even get that usually, so okay. I'm not really sure in terms of what else. I know that... Seth always tells me that I'm on his license to work with these weapons, and that's all I really know. And that's kind of the same with Sarah, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Not really sure what that's ever meant. Seth always just says Hannah and Sarah are on my license. Okay. But as far as, like, you go, there's no... Um, no one really asks about 
much of that. Like, you don't have to take safety classes in regards to anything with movie sets. So that's the thing. I was actually just getting into the union and with the union and everything because on this set they hired me non-union. Um, but normally with the unions you take a safety course, you take a sexual harassment course, and you take a few different things. And I had, like, literally just gotten the paperwork and everything to get in that. And you need 30 union days on a union show before you can do that. And so I had 22 before this job. And so a lot of the days from this job were going to count towards that. Okay. But, yeah, so I wasn't even able to get that. But for other than that, like, the... The, the whole industry doesn't really require anything. It's mostly just California or Union, and I wasn't Union. Okay. And so Rust wasn't like, you know, like I obviously have to have a cert to be a cop. Yeah, no, and totally. Like, like, you know, every year I got to take, like, driving courses and shooting courses and everything like that. Yeah, no, totally. Um, yeah, no, Rust didn't really ask me anything about that. They kind of just conferred it all through CASA. Okay. Um, so, I heard that you were hired to do a couple jobs on this set. Yes. Can you talk about or tell me about both of them? Okay. So, uh, like originally when I got on the set, you know, I have always done armor kind of really separate from props. Like, I'm always with props, but I usually, we do it ourselves, me and my dad, and props doesn't really interfere. This is the only job that I've taken where I was heavily incorporated into props, and it's because originally they had hired me for armor and key prop assistant. And that's not just like prop assistant, that's the key prop assistant. So that means more responsibility, that means I'm Sarah's second Okay. in a lot of cases. So if there's an issue with props, you would go to Sarah, and then if there's an issue the where Sarah can't, you know, isn't there, then it goes to me, and then we have our assistant, Nicole. So I had <clears throat> my job as the armor, and originally I thought that I was mostly going to be doing my armor job and kind of left alone to do that. But after the first week, uh, I got talked to by some people in production, and they were told that I wasn't really pulling my weight in props. So basically I was told that I needed to shift my focus less on armor and more on props. Who did they expect to take on the armor role if it wasn't your... I don't know. They told me, they said, yeah, we hear that you're taking your armor job very seriously, but we need you to support props right now because props is also struggling. And I was like, okay, I'll try my best to do that. And they said, normally before that I would kind of just hang out in the prop truck and, like, you know, work on the guns and just kind of be in there doing my own stuff if, the, if there weren't any guns on set. But after that, they had told me, like, no, we want you on set. We want you as a present on set for props. Okay. Yeah, so was so, split up quite a bit. Can you give me some examples of what you would do, like, when you were assisting props? Okay, yeah. So <clears throat> uh, normally, you know, I kind of, like, for the saloon scene, I would just kind of be standing there, you know, watching over the guns and everything, checking them for the actors as I had brought them into the actors. That's just my job as the armor. With the saloon and everything, I'm pouring drinks for props. I'm running outside and rolling cigarettes. I'm, like, doing several different things and grabbing several different props and setting props up constantly. And so, yeah, when some scenes aren't exactly super prop heavy and sometimes they're just kind of gun heavy, and so in that case I can, like, focus more on the guns, but sometimes I would split between running the guns, and also dealing with the props. Mm -hmm. But Nicole, the assistant, tried to help Ellis alleviate that a little bit, but not every, you know, she's she was pretty green, so had to step in a lot. Okay. Yeah. Mostly I thought that I was there doing props at the beginning just to help find everything because we got hired on a week before. Normally you hire the prop master a month in advance. Sarah got brought on a week before I got brought on a little after her. And so we were just kind of running around that first week trying to find props. And then I thought after that, you know, after she got the assistant, I'd be able to focus more on the guns. But then production talked to me and said that I needed to focus more on props. So. Okay. And who's from production? Um, Gabrielle Pickle and um, also the head of the art department, Brian. 
it mostly, yeah, Sarah just said that I couldn't really support props in the way needed, so they were talking about possibly taking, I was talking to them, and I was like, well, do you not want me to do props at all in this case and just focus on the guns? And they were like, no, like, we don't want Nicole stepping up and taking your position. We want you to step into this position, and we think it's a great opportunity for you, but really, I just got to do two jobs for less pay. Yeah. How yeah. did you feel about the added responsibility? Uh, you know, it was a lot, but uh, I'm super eager, and when someone kind of says, uh, like, you know, you can do this, like, then I'm just like, okay, now I have to show them, like, I can do this, you yeah. know? So, ultimately, it was frustrating, but at the same time, I was like, all right, got to go and kick ass and props now, I guess, too. Yeah. Did you ever have, like, any time that specifically pointed out to you where you felt overwhelmed? Um, well, you know, props, we were told a lot, you know, that we were kind of lagging and, like, the Wranglers would kind of shit on us for not propping up horses soon enough or, like, not getting actors propped up soon enough. So props was definitely struggling. And then after um, that talk I had with Brian, I went to Sarah and I was like, I'm not, like, pulling my weight, you know? And I tried to talk to her about it and she was like, yeah, I didn't mean to, like, be a jerk about it. I just wanted to let them know that I needed more help in the department. And so we talked about it, and I was like, well, that's cool. Just maybe next time go ahead and talk to me first before going to Brian and Gabrielle. Um, do you know why they didn't utilize Nicole more? They, uh, well, we, you know, we definitely did utilize Nicole, but ultimately I have a very strong personality. And also, a lot of the times, like, my personality would even be stronger than Sarah's in a lot of respects. And um, a lot of people were already kind of gaining respect for me, like, in terms of, like, you know, the Wranglers and everything. And I'm just good at meshing with other departments, okay. you know. So they wanted me on set more just to kind of, you know, be a presence of props and really, you know, kind of just be a demanding force. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you ever express to them at any point if you felt overwhelmed or? Um, after that, you know, I thought we were doing pretty good of managing both. There were some days, you know, where I would talk to Sarah and I was like, like, she would be like, could you come out here and see what's going on with me? And I was like, no, dude, I need to, like, focus on guns and I need to pull guns for later on. And she would be like, well, you're the second. I think you should be here with me on set to watch this. And I was like, there's not a lot of props out there. I'm going to be here doing the guns. Okay. So there was a couple of times that I also kind of really held my ground on not, you know, spreading myself too incredibly thin. Or getting overrun by yeah. others. Yeah, exactly. Because you kind of just have to, you know. But ultimately with higher positions, sometimes you get ran over. Okay. Uh, who hired you for Rust? Uh, I believe, I'm not really sure. Seth just texted me and he was like, you got the job, prop assistant, so-and-so. I sent him my resume and they, uh, Sarah sent it in and I think Roe approved it. And yeah, so Sarah, Sarah hired me, Roe approved it. Okay. So it's not like a typical hiring process for a job where... You have to go in and... Yeah, no, there's no there's no real interviews, like, any time in film. Film is a very weird industry. Word of mouth. Word of mouth, by all means. I think it's so weird how, like, secretive it is almost, you know? Like, it's really hard to get on anything unless you know somebody. And if you stop working for a while, it's, like, almost hard to jump back in it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really weird. You can't just, like, look up, like, film jobs in your area and then go and apply. It's not, that's Indeed. not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> I really wish it was kind of like that. That would probably, yeah, that would be a lot better. But right now there's just such a media surge, especially, that, you know, they're just kind of getting on anyone that they can bring, really, because the media surge with all of these different, uh, like, the networks and everything coming out with their own little Internet things, it's making everything, like, boom right now, like, crazy. Yeah. Um, I know you had talked about how you were in the process of becoming a union member. Yeah. With which union? Uh, 
I was working on becoming a union member with the local 44. Okay. That's the oldest and longest established union, and it's also the one that my dad's a part of. So. Is that like international or? Um, I'm not really entirely sure. I know it's mostly California. You know, each union is kind of specific to the area. Um, yeah, I think that one is the most put together one, and it's definitely the most active one, which is why I was trying to be a part of it. And I had already actually started the like kind of OSHA safety one a little bit after this actually so I had already been starting that because okay. I just got in like a little bit before that into the program. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as far as your employment on Rust, were you hired on a contract or how, I was how did you determine? I was hired on a, on a contract, yeah, you know. Uh, the, the contract wasn't really specific to the job, per se. The contract was just like regular employee contract. Jason has a copy of it. Okay. Is there any way I can get a copy? Sure. Yeah, I'll send that. Yeah. Um, besides you and Sarah and Nicole, were there any other armorers and prop masters or anybody brought onto the set at any time? Um. I don't believe so. Not anyone brought on the set. Uh, I don't really know if Seth ever came to set, but he was the mentor on the paperwork and everything, and he was like where we got most of our stuff from. Okay. Yeah. But no one else ever worked with you guys. They didn't do like a late hire. Oh, uh, so they did. They did bring in one girl for swing shift, but I don't even know if she ever made it to set or if she just met up with Sarah outside of set. Okay. Um, but yeah, we had finally, week two was coming around and we told them like, we're, it's getting crazy busy, we can't have Sarah leaving set to go find these things, so they brought in a day player that could run around and go find things for us. Okay. Because before that, Sarah had to leave set a lot of the time. Oh, that also contributed to spreading us thin for a little while there. That's why they brought in the third person, because ultimately Sarah would have to leave set pretty much every day for several hours, and then it would just be me out there. And what would Sarah go do at that time? Sarah would go try to find props, because with them bringing her in a week, you know, it's hard to find, like, a weird Indian axe, you know? Like, <laughs> there's a bunch of weird, obscure things for a period piece that are super hard to find. So she would go try to find them, meet up with other prop masters in the area and see if they had them. Do you know who that fourth was? Um, you know... I think her name was Jade. Jade? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was hoping for her to come more on set, but yeah, they just hired her as a day player every now and then. Okay. Okay, so as far as, um, and I know some of this that we've talked about before, um, some of it might be a little bit redundant. It's okay. Um, but yeah. just trying to cover all bases. Mm -hmm. Um, so, again, who provides the ammo? So, as far as I'm concerned, me and Sarah, <clears throat> we went together and we picked up the ammunition and all the weapons and my leathers from Seth Kenny in Albuquerque at his shop. Um, yeah, we got two boxes of ammo, I'm pretty sure, that day. And then um, as we went on in the show, there were a couple of times that we needed more. So Sarah and I would text him, you know, that we needed more. And occasionally Sarah brought in more ammo from Seth. Okay. Those two boxes that were originally supplied, were they blanks or dummies? Originally supplied. You um, that you picked up two boxes of ammo. Oh, yeah. So... Um, I or think they were mean like boxes, like the white boxes. No, they were they like, were they were like bigger boxes okay. for sure. Um, yeah, no, a lot of them were. Uh, there wasn't a lot of dummies in those really much at all. There were some dummies, you know, like obscure dummies that we couldn't really get, like uh, the fifty seventy rounds. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with those. Those are big rounds. They go in the trap door. So we had some of those dummies with it. But in terms of 45 long colt dummies, I don't think there was a lot of dummies in there. And so I asked Seth about it, and I said, hey, like, where's all the long colt dummies? Because the 45, you know, 45 ammo is, like, different than 45 long colt. So we didn't exactly, I couldn't find that. So 
I, he told me to check the dummies that I had from the last show because he got me those ones and everything. And so I went back through a bag that I had. This bag had, like, a bunch of loose dummies in it. And I went through and I checked all of them and I put them into two boxes. And so we had two boxes of 45 long quilt dummies that were mine from the last show well, originally. Cage. Yeah. Okay. And I had just brought those off of the old way and they were in my car for like two weeks. I jumped right off of the old way into this. I was barely home for like a week. So, yeah. so he told you to check your split. Yeah. And what you had to take it. Yeah. So he authorized you to bring He authorized me to bring yeah, dummies. Okay. And then also there was one time where he didn't give us any eighth loads and I had one box of eighth loads and so I was like So Corporal just to be clear, what we've just heard, um, did Ms. Gutierrez tell you that she brought two boxes of dummies onto the set of rust that she had left over from the old way? Yes. And did she also explain that they were loose in a bag in her car and they had been there for two weeks? That's correct. And did she explain that she took them out of the bag and put them in boxes? Yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my box of eighth loads, put it on the invoice, and I would have received money for that. For okay. blanks. For blanks, yeah. Eighth load blanks. Okay. Did you ever get recompensated for this? Uh, no. I don't really plan on it, uh, given the circumstances, um, because usually that goes through Seth, and then Seth kicks me down with whatever. Okay. Yeah. So, how many rounds, and, I, and two boxes is, you know, kind of hard for us to, we're just trying to understand, so how many rounds would you say were supplied at the beginning? You know, mind if I check my phone really yeah. quick? I think Seth, like, sent me a picture of, like, it written on cardboard or something. Yeah. Okay. Or actually, if you look at the boxes, I think the boxes on the flap. Yeah, on the flap should say it. Okay. Did you see that at all? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't. That's the, yeah, okay, okay. that's what Seth showed me. So that same thing, that's what should have all been in there. Okay. Um, and so you and Sarah picked it up at the beginning yeah. of production. Yeah. Um, from Albuquerque, brought it to set. And then yeah, but we couldn't exactly bring it to set right away because they hadn't had the prop truck ready for us, so... We had to leave it, you know, she had the guns in her car in Albuquerque. I had the ammo in my trunk at the hotel, and then we just took him to set the next day. Okay, so it was what? Like overnight, a, yeah, just like overnight. Period. It was like multiple days that, that's a... Uh, multiple days of what? That's, I was just going to say, for Sarah to keep all those in her vehicle in Albuquerque, that's the mm -hmm. well, move. Well, and it, was only, it was only one night, and she had a garage. Okay. So that's why we ultimately, she was like, do you want them to go with you or me? And I was like, you, you have a garage, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, Albuquerque, though. Oh, Albu yeah. oh, I know. I told her. <laughs> Sonny was all like, get those and get out. And I was like, hell yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so when you guys brought additional rounds on the set or additional boxes or needed more, how did those get delivered? Uh, Sarah brought them in most okay. of the time. I never saw Seth after the first time that I saw him before the show. Okay. So did Sarah, do you know if she went and picked them up from Albuquerque or how did she get them? She, she lived in Albuquerque, so most of the time she would just run and grab them. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if she got any more from anyone else. I had heard that some of the dummies were borrowed from someone. I don't know. She said, don't lose any of these because we have to give them back. And I was like, okay, they fall out of the gun belt and everything, but I'll try not to lose them. Okay. And then how much did you supply of your own? Of my own dummies? Yeah. Just the two. And we mostly went through those right away just because mm. two boxes, two of the little boxes, not like big boxes, just the, the little boxes. And, yeah, I had two of those, and some, most of mine had the no primer caps, the ones that I showed you, remember? Is it the ones that I, like, invented in? Yes. Okay. So a lot of those were mine, and then also uh, 
I had a multitude of the ones with holes and the ones you shake, so yeah. And I checked those all and I put them into two things Okay. myself, yeah. Do you remember what those boxes looked like? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, they usually say JS on them. Okay. Um, this is one that my dad sent me. And mine are usually beat up pretty bad. Okay. Like, they're very dirty and uh, gross, usually. Okay. Do you know what the JS stands for in them? Uh, Joe Swanson. Okay. Have you met Joe? I have not, but him and my dad are pretty good friends. Okay. Yeah. Let me stop it there for a moment. Um, Corporal, did Ms. Gutierrez uh, show you a photograph on her phone during the interview? Yes, she did. And did she indicate to you that the photograph that she was showing you was a photograph of the box uh, or a box that would be like the box that she brought onto the set that had dummies? Yes. And did she tell you who she got that photo from? She um, said in her interview that she got that photo from her father, which is Bill Reed. And I'm going to show you what has uh, previously been uh, admitted into evidence as State's Exhibit 69. Do you see that? Yes. Is that the exact photo that she showed you during the interview? Yes, it is. Thank you. Does this look exactly like the uh, box of dummies that Mr. Benavides took from the prop cart on October 21st, 2021? Yes, it looks exactly like okay. it. Thank you. All right, so as far as the ammo goes, who has access? Um, and they stay, they stay in the truck, like, on, um, you know, the only thing that's in the safe is the guns. So, yeah, pretty much, I don't know if they locked the prop truck at night or what happened with that, but, yeah, so pretty much just me, Nicole, Sarah, and the first week we did share that prop truck with locations. Okay. Um... But other than that, the prop truck, you know, would kind of be open most days just because we're running in and out of there. And sometimes, you know, ammo is underneath on our cart, just showing there usually. Like on the floor of the On shelf. the bottom. No, on the on, cart. Okay. On yeah. the second shelf. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I usually try to keep it down there. So all the ammo is pretty much out in the open. Possibly. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, unless it wasn't, like, taken out directly of the boxes or anything, then yeah, the ones that are out there are out in the open pretty much regularly. Okay, and they never get locked up in a safe? No. Okay. Um, were all the guns provided by Seth? Yes. And who has access to the guns? Uh, Sarah and I, and I believe Nicole kind of knew the, the code, but I don't think she remembered it most of the time. Okay. Yeah. Did she ever remove the guns from the thing? I had her put them away sometimes. Okay. Mostly just because I couldn't leave that. Okay. Yeah. And does anybody watch her do that? Uh, no, not really. Is she allowed to? Uh, mostly somebody has to lock them up and they shouldn't be on set so you know Sarah or I would give her permission to go over there and just put them in there okay yeah but that's something that you guys are allowed to do is give someone else permission to I would think up. for a prop assistant yeah okay she only put them away ever so who all has the ability to lock the safe I mean anyone that has arms 
like can close it. Yeah. Is that you don't have to punch in the code again to lock it? No. So you turn the knob and it's done? Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the truck? Who has the ability to lock the truck? You know, none of us lock the truck ever. Um, we figure that's kind of like the Transco's job. We don't have locks for the trucks normally. Uh, I know some prop masters lock up their own trucks, but yeah, I'm not really sure. We kind of just close ours up every day. Okay. Do you know? I don't know if Transco ever locked it. Okay. Do you know who was in charge of that truck? Um, not specifically. Okay. I don't remember his name. It was a male, though. Yeah. Can you describe him? He was a sweet old Hispanic man with a nice mustache. Okay. Have you said midway? Midway. And he was the one primarily in charge of that truck? Towards like the second week, yeah. Before that, we kind of just had random people moving it. Um, and then eventually he got assigned to us pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the morning when you got there, was it ever locked up? No. Okay. So you just walk in? Walk in and pull the handle. Okay. What about the back of it? I know it's got one of those big... Yeah, that's what we normally did. Yeah, we uh, just closed up the side and we would unlock the handle. We figured it was usually getting watched by security. Do they just have security, and it's okay if you don't know, but do they just have security at that front gate there, or do they have... I know that I've seen some security around other parts of set, like just in a car, but that was mostly after the incident and everything, and it was just a car near the church. Okay. So that's really all I know about the security measures. Right. So you say, um, as far as ammo goes, it is common to have it outside of that safe. Isn't yeah, that no, right? it's... It's super common to have it outside of the safe. Okay. Who loads the ammo into the guns? Me and Sarah. Okay, you both load them. Yeah. And who loads ammo into, like, the bandoliers or the belts? And That's me and Sarah again. Uh, I think Nicole helped us a couple of times shaking them. Okay. Yeah. Did she ever, like, actually load them, or did she just shake into them the and say they're good? And she would shake them and put them into the belt with me. Okay. Yeah. Do you know how often, or should I say, when did you guys put the ammo in the bandoliers? Um, a lot of them already had it in there. So, from the last Nick Cage set and everything. So, still check those ones out and everything. But we, of course, had a couple more that we had to, like, switch around and everything. So, mostly the whole first week. We were switching them around, and then after that, we did have a couple more characters come in with different, you know, waist sizes, so we would have to, like, put them in other belts, too. So some of these belts already had rounds in them? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Do you remember which ones? No. They mostly, yeah, they mostly got switched around a lot, and a lot of them fell out. <coughs> Pretty regularly out of the, rounds in them. yeah, okay. the dummy rounds would fall out sometimes just because when they're riding the horses, they jiggle out. Okay. Um, so you regularly have to put more in them. So since some of this ammo came from another production, was the ammo in those belts ever checked? Yeah. So you guys physically removed them from the belts? Yeah. And checked them? Yes. Okay. And who all did the checking? That was me. That was involved in the two boxes that I did. At the beginning? Yes. All right. Um, so when ammo's not being used, then does it ever go back in a box? Does it stay? When ammo's not being used, um, if it's about to be used, it's there on the bottom of the cart. Like, if we're going to get into it later that day, we don't really have time to run back to the truck. So we usually keep it right there if we're shooting that day. If we're not shooting that day, it doesn't really come on set. I'll usually bring, like, maybe a box of quarter loads just in case they randomly decide that they want to shoot something because they'll change their minds last minute, and then you have to be prepared for that. Who's they? Uh, directors, actors, 
whoever just like feels like mm, maybe I shouldn't be shooting right now, kind of. Okay. So when you go to unload the belts or the guns, anything of the sort, um, does it go back in a box? The belt? The like ammo. We, we don't ever take once the once the the dummies are on the belt, they stay on the belt, and the belts just get hung in the prop truck. Okay. Like yeah, and then. Uh, for the guns and everything, yeah, we take all the dummies out if it's dummied up, and then of course we take the blanks out too. And but where do they go? They go back in a box. Okay. Or sometimes the dummies they'll go on the cart on the top of the cart. Okay. So would you say that animals ever mixed the dummies and the blanks, or just you know various kinds of dummies? Well, various kinds of dummies, yeah. Like I told you, all dummies are kind of weird and individual in their own way, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, they were mixed pretty regularly. Okay. So it's not like, you know, I say, hey, I take these rounds out of here, and they have to go back in that specific box because these are... No, they just oh. go in a dummy box. Okay. In a box of dummies. Um... So our actors are, or crew members on set, are they um, advised to self-inspect weapons? Uh, I'm not really sure. I Well, most of the time when they tell me, like, I'll go up to them and I'm like, here, and I show them it's clear, they'll be like, it's okay, I trust you. I say, don't trust me. You know, go ahead and always check for yourself. Okay. But, um, but yeah. Are they not required to self-check? No, not really. Okay. But I do I do show them them every time before I hand them off to them. All right. Um, show them that the gun's clear. Have you seen any of them do their own safety checks? Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Jensen does his own safety checks. Uh, Travis does his own safety checks. Travis and Mel. Um, uh, Devin was getting into doing his own safety checks because I taught him how to do it. So he was kind of getting better at that. Uh, what did they do to do these checks? Pull the hammer back to half cock, spin it around, and close it. Okay. Yeah. So not pulling it, round out, checking them themselves? Mm, no, not really. Okay. Um, has it ever been common practice for actors to do? I'm not really too sure. What about on your last production? Did they ever do their own? Uh, Nick Cage definitely did not. Uh, he barely really cared to train with the gun at all. Um, a lot of actors sometimes will barely care to train with the gun at all and think that they'll just do it on the day. Um, and But, yeah, no, not a lot of them take it out and check them. Okay. Um, when you or somebody gives a gun to an actor, um, do you tell them, like, hey, these are the rounds that are in this gun? Like, do you tell them it's hot or cold? And then what kind of ammo is in the gun? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I tell them, I tell them, all right, so this is a clear gun if there's no dummies in it, right? If it's dummied up, I show them and I say this is dummied up, and usually I have the dummies that have no primer cap in there. So I'll show them that. And then if it's hot, I'll tell them it's hot, and I'll tell them four quarter loads or four eighth loads or whatever is in the gun. Yeah, okay. and I let them know exactly how many is in there, and I put it exactly to where they'll shoot it and it'll go for that time. Okay. Have you ever allowed access um, to anyone? for any of these firearms? No. Like for using them on set or? For any purpose that well, I allow outside of what their scope was. No. Um, like after hours, during lunch? No. You know, days that you guys weren't? No, we, me, Nicole, and Sarah ate lunch together pretty regularly. Uh, pretty much every day, except for a couple of days where I would sit at another table or converse with some other people. But, yeah, we all went to lunch together. We all locked them up every day at lunch, and we all locked them up every night. And I definitely didn't go to work on my weekends because why would I do that, <laughs> you know? 
Right. I want to be there as least as possible. Don't we all? Yeah. So yeah, last weekend I wasn't. I was in Denver the first weekend actually. So yeah, and then the other one I was just relaxing at my hotel. Okay. Um, did you spend any time with anybody on the weekend? Yeah, I spent some time uh, with the nice boy at the front desk at my hotel. He was nice. Um, I hung out with some crew members. We went bowling one time. And other than that, I didn't really hang out with people outside of set too much. And I kind of went and did my own thing in Denver the week before. We haven't really been there that long. Okay. Um, did you go out... Did you go out um, with the crew one night too? I think they said like uh, some brewery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went to the brewery downtown after bowling. After bowling. Yeah. Okay. And that was on a day off though. So. Yeah. Did you have work the next day? No, that was uh, Monday. We worked. We we had Monday Tuesday off. Okay. Do you remember which Monday it was? It was the last Monday before the incident. Okay. So 20th was the incident, I believe, on Wednesday? 21st. 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 So. The 11th? The Monday. Columbus Day? The holiday? Or would that be the 18th? No. Yeah, it would be the, it would be the 18th. Okay. So you're off that Monday and Tuesday. Yeah. And then we're back. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Um, have you yourself, and not just on this set, but have you ever um, encountered a defective blank or a defective dummy? Yeah. So, you know, I've had a couple of blanks that haven't gone off, you know, but usually that's because the actor doesn't pull the hammer all the way back, and so it'll just be at half cock, and so when they shoot it, it won't ignite it, and I usually just say, like, oh, it was a misfire to kind of save the actor's face a little bit in that case. Mm -hmm. um, and then for, in terms of bad dummies, I had never experienced a bad dummy. Okay. Um, so what's your standard protocol, like, if one of them's defective? Either one, one either the blanks. Either one. Okay, so if the blanks are defective, you know, um, usually I'll just take them, I'll put them in my pocket, I'll save them for later, and then if I'm curious enough, I'll just go ahead and, like, shoot them and be like, okay, yeah, they didn't pull the hammer all the way back. Or if the, if the dummies were defective, I guess, I would put them in my pocket and just save them to later and check them out. Okay. Um, have you ever, in your history of working, encountered live rounds on the set? Never. Okay, and how do you know that? Uh, because every dummy I've ever shaken has been a dummy, and the other ones have holes in the side, and I've never experienced a round that looked like a dummy and behaved like a blank or anything. So, yeah, I am shaking all of them most of the time. Okay. So. And then, I know you've said this a million times, but just do me a favor, go over uh, each round and then how the round. Corporal, did Ms. Gutierrez tell you she was shaking all of them? Is your, is your microphone on? Sorry. Did Ms. Gutierrez tell you that she was shaking all of them most of the time? Yes. Thank you. Each round of blanks? Yeah, and dummies. So I know okay. that there's like obviously a couple different kinds of dummies. All right, yeah. Okay. You don't have to go into like no, every okay. specific caliber or anything of that sort, but just. Okay. Let's, uh, all right. So a lot of dummies, the ones with primer caps, those ones mostly go in the belts and everything. Uh, a lot of the primer caps are punctured most of the time, you know, because they get hit while they're in the gun. So those will go in the gun sometimes uh, if I don't have the other ones. There are some with holes in the side uh, that also still have the primer caps and everything. And then there's the ones with no primer caps, and there's no and there's a hole in the side sometimes too with those, and sometimes there's not. Um, and mostly I like to put the ones with no primer caps into the guns, you know, just to make everyone feel safe. Um, and then for the other ones, those go in the belts, you know, and. Uh, the ones that have the primer cap.
Corporal, is it your understanding from your investigation that the dummies that were put into Mr. Baldwin's prop gun on October 21st, 2021, all had missing primer caps? No. And the hole in the side are good for both, really. Okay. And then, and then for open. all the lows, yeah, all right. So for all the blanks, all the quarters, um, so there's eighth lows. Those are the super quietest ones. And I just worked with Ryan Armstrong, that little 11-year-old on the old way, and I had her use those. So especially if it's someone that's really young and new with the guns, I'll make sure that they're the smallest load possible, which is an eighth. Um, some horses require eighth loads. Um, most of the time, I'll put horsey. I'll put the box and I'll put horsey rounds on them in my own handwriting, so that way I know. Um, and are those the eighth? Yeah, those are the eighth. And then sometimes, you know, um, I will if it's super close proximity and inside eighths too. But quarters also work for inside proximities that are close. Um, and then on top of that. Uh, for the quarters, around kids, around horses too. That's like the last size pretty much allowed. And then we do the half loads if it's going into like a rifle or if we're outside. Like we did a lot of half loads on the show because a lot of it was outside. And then for the full loads, it's very rare still that I use a full load unless like an actor is just really weird and wants it. Uh, Alec only wanted to train with full loads because he wanted it to look realistic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, most of the time I'll use full loads if it's a really big gun, like a trap door or something, a trap door rifle. You, that would have a lot of smoke coming out of it, so you want to make sure it looks realistic. Okay. Um, were all of these used for rest? Fulls were used for us, some of my eighths were used for us, quarters were used for us, and halves were used for us, yeah. Okay. So it was really a variety and just depending on the situation. Okay. And then is anyone allowed to bring their personal firearms on the set? Uh, no. Did you see anybody bring personal firearms? No. And did you ever see anyone bring ammo? No. Okay. Did anybody ask you about going target shooting? Uh, yeah. The 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 Wrangler had made a joke about it one time to me, and I said something to the effect of, "Well, you can try. You don't have the ammo." Okay. What did they say? Do you remember? Uh, not really. I don't really remember what they said. What they insinuated about shooting actual rounds. Yeah. Okay. I think that they were joking though. Okay. A lot of boys on set will be like, oh my god, can we go shoot the guns? It's just, yeah. But no one pressured you into it? No, no one ever seriously pressured me into it. Oh, uh, what about Sarah? What about Sarah? Did, it, did she ever mention anything about shooting? No. Sarah, yeah, no, she never mentioned anything about shooting, and we left every day at the same time and pretty much got there just around a little after each other. Okay. Um, so as far as safety protocols on set, um, do you recall any sort of safety protocols during the time of the production? Um, we had a couple of safety meetings. A lot of days we did not which normally it's typical any time that there's firearms or live animals on set or open flame, you do a safety meeting. So a lot of those days that we did not have a safety meeting. Um, other than that, Who safety hosted them? Huh? Who hosted those safety meetings? Safe. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember what they were about? Um, Guns, my, the guns and everything. We also said, you know, because actors will leave guns around sometimes. They'll forget them. So we always told people, you know, like, don't ever touch a gun if you see it, you know, because Jensen totally left his on the snack bar one time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we found that pretty promptly. But. Isn't your uh, snack bar down at base camp? No. 
Where was it? It's on set. We can't like go all the way back to base for okay. snacks. Well, so I like, mm-hmm. no, uh, our cafeteria. I think you're thinking of the cafeteria. Yeah, where we went. Yeah, no, we have crafty on set, really close to set most of the time. Okay. Yeah. I was like, oh, that would be interesting. You're talking about the snack bar, like the little like trailer that has all the. No, it's crafty. It's just a table on set with like nutritious bars on it. My favorite part of getting to work movie sets is Oh they yeah. Have, like, a little I love when they have the trailer, oh, yeah. Okay. Those are the legit ones. This one was like stupid cheap. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. They like barely let her make soup for us. They barely <laughs> met, let her make soups for us and she had to fight hard for the soup. Mm-hmm. I called Becca the soup angel. She fought hard for those soups. <laughs> um, did you ever see Safety Bulletin? Where would they be posted, I wonder? Um, you know, sometimes they would put some things in the call sheet, you know, like some safety bulletins and everything. Do you remember what they said? Um, I think they would pertain to COVID. They would pertain to, you know, like fu- firearms on set. They would pertain to live animals. Uh, yeah, it's usually kind of like in red on the call sheets. Okay. Other than that, they would sometimes in an email, like, put it in red, like, anything you needed to know about the day. Do you still have those emails? I have, I think I might have some of those emails still. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to yes. grab those? Yeah, because, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, you know, obviously a, yeah. Yeah. a big, uh, who distributes, because you guys get, would get call sheets the night before. Yeah. Right. Tim Tim Bezerra usually sends them out. Okay. Yeah. What is his position? He is also an assistant director, but he's more of the type where he is never on set and his only job is sitting in the office and creating these schedules and doing all the paperwork. So he's normally out. Um, yeah, he's normally never on set, that poor boy. All right. Who would you say is in charge of the safety meetings that are being held? Dave, and then uh, the first time we did it, he let me speak, um, yeah, and I told people, you know, like, these are regular weapons we have on set, don't stand in front of them, don't point them at anybody, and then after that, the only other one we had was the day of, and Dave kind of just covered most of that. Okay, do you remember what he talked about the day? Not entirely. He just told everybody, like, you know, we do have, like, blanks on set. We are going to have a lot of gunfire today. We have real guns on set. No one touched them, you know. Okay. And things like that. And also things about the horses, he told. When did you host a safety meeting? I never hosted one all by myself. Okay. What well, you said that he let you do one, though? He let, me, he let me hop in on his. Okay. Yeah, he said, Hannah, do you have anything else to add? And I said, yeah. And I said, let's be safe. You know, like, no one be standing in the way of these things and just, like, don't be, if it's pointing in that direction, don't stand in front of it. Okay. Do you remember what day that was, though? That was the first day we had gunfire on set, which I believe was the second day that uh, we started uh, on set uh, filming. Okay. So, yeah. So what do you teach um, actors or crew members when it comes to gun safety? So it really um, also depends on the actors, too. You know, like big ones like Nick Cage, if they tell me, if or if they tell the director, like, you know, they, that they don't really care to do it, I can try to teach them for the most part, but, like, a lot of the times they might not even listen to me or really pay attention or be on their phone. Alec was on his phone a lot of that entire thing. But for the most part, uh, they put me in training this time. It was pretty irregular how I trained actors this time. This time they put nine people all together in one day that I was supposed to train. And during this time, they put a ton of producers right there. Normally I train the actors one-on-one. It makes them feel comfortable. It allows them to not be distracted and everything. And this time they had me training three people at once and um, a ton of producers behind me. The director is there, too. The producers are talking to the actors. The actors were distracted, even, too. 
Um, and I tried to do my best to work with all three of them. I worked with Jensen. You could probably see a video of him saying, like, you know, she showed me, like, this is how you check it. You know, this is how we make sure it's safe. So I try to do that standard same thing every time, show them how to check their own gun and show them how to make sure it's safe. Um, and then I always talk, I have them draw it a few times, you know, with nothing in there. Make sure that they have the draw down. Uh, usually a little before that, I'll have them like just fire off a couple of quarter loads, you know, so they can get the idea of not drawing it from their thing, but just holding it and firing it so they can get, so they can understand what they're going to be doing. Okay. And then after that, we work on uh, the actions that they're going to specifically do. So, you know, if I know that they have a scene and everything, we kind of talk it out together and like how they would run, pull it out, what they could do, you know, how not to let it fall on the ground, how not to like let rocks get inside of it. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. What about safety rules? Do you advise them any of those? Safety rules such as I tell them all the time uh, not to point them at each other. Uh, that's my biggest one and I always say to everyone in front of them, I'm like, if you don't have to be here, don't be here. You know, um, other than that, safety-wise, um, I tell them to keep their finger out of the trigger guard unless they're ready to shoot because that's how a lot of um, accidental discharges will happen. In my, that's just what my dad's told me at least. So I always try to advise them to keep their finger out of the trigger guard and, yeah. Okay. Um, besides you, were there any other trained armorers on the set? Mm, Sarah was kind of trained by Seth. Yeah. I believe Sarah did a show before, and I think that there were two guns involved in the show. And Seth had trained her personally for that. Okay. And then I also kind of showed her what to do at the beginning of it to make sure that she wouldn't have an accidental discharge. But she still did, so, yeah. Um, so before any um, gun scene, even just like rehearsal or filming or anything of the sort, did they do a brief? Uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes they would have time to like really go into it and everything and like kind of, you know, work out the action. Sometimes they would do like an overall one, you know, where they kind of just say like bang, 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 bang. So we did have some rehearsals. Sometimes, you know, there wasn't always rehearsals. Okay. So sometimes, yeah, we totally had, like, rehearsals, usually the big ones, and we just kind of have people go bang, 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 bang. All right. Um, as far as, so what it's been referred to me as the show and tell day where you brought out Yeah. Um, pretty much everything, right? Yeah, we brought out every gun that we had that Seth gave to us, and uh, the director really just wanted a lot of options for people, especially because there are so many big names on this. So he wanted to be sure that all the actors knew that it was possible for them to switch around their guns, and that just because we had thought that they would look good with that gun doesn't mean that they were stuck with it. Okay. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail about how this day played out, like, where did you guys set up this table? Okay. And yeah. So the day played out. Um, we go to the edge of the town and everything, uh, away from all the people working on the other side. Um, they set up a table. They set up an easy up for us, and um, the prop truck was coming later that day. So that was finally the first day that we got Council. to get the prop truck going. I brought. How long does she go into the day? You're. I'm sorry, I don't recall. Was it more than 20 minutes? Let's let's break so that we can have this uninterrupted. What went on in the day? And and, and just just to be clear, I think what she's talking about is the day of the show and tell. Is oh. that is that your understanding, Corporal? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought it was the day of October 21. Uh, I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. Do you want me to keep going, or you want to break? No, we'll keep going. Okay. Sorry. The gun safe in my tiny Hyundai fitted in there, and so I had that with me right next to us, and I kept 
all the ammunition in my trunk and everything, and I kept, and Sarah had all of the guns in her trunk, and so we took all those guns out of the trunk, and we put them on the table. We had two tables, so we had two tables filled with long rifles, short guns, a lot of guns. Um, and then also, once the show and tell was over, um, Joel was pretty cool. He was happy with everything. Um, after that was over, he stuck around, and then, like, I think the first a couple of actors showed up for training and everything because I remember they said, like, okay, you're going to have, like, three at this time and, like, three here and three there. And I was like, all right, like, that's kind of manageable. And it is kind of manageable, you know, and it definitely I've worked with two at a time before. Three is manageable, but, like, also then all of a sudden with the actors, all these producers came, like a ton of producers. And so the producers are just kind of behind us the whole time. The guns are out there. We put a lot of them away that we didn't need for the training that day. So Sarah put a lot of those away, and we just kept those in my car because I had the safe, and ultimately I was going to put them in the safe at the end of the day. Um, and then so the actors came. We started training and everything. And then all of a sudden, a producer just, like, jumps into the training because I guess he was also firing, but they didn't schedule him for me. So at one point, I was training four people at one time, which is a little chaotic. Um, yeah, so, so I'm there. Them, sorry, but when you had them all out on the table, how many people would you say were there, like, max at a time that were? Probably, like, ten. Nothing. Ten, and, like, not everyone was really allowed to mess with them. You know, like, a couple producers, like, would ask if they could touch them. Ultimately, I always get pissed at people if they touch them without my permission. Okay. Joel, I let do that. You know, Joel is the director. He can touch them. Um, but, yeah, other than that, most people were there, and most people would be, like, wouldn't even ask to touch them. Yeah, good, like, ten producers were there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Gabby and Ro were there at the beginning, and eventually, like, they left with kind of everybody. Okay. And then yeah. towards the end of the So at the beginning of the day, I was supposed to train six, uh, and then I had an hour-long break, you know, um, and I think I was there from, like, nine to, like, two or eight to, yeah, nine to two, just training actors pretty much the entire time um, and doing the show and tell. And then so I trained six of them then, and then plus that producer that they threw in there randomly. And then after that, an hour went by, and I trained Devin, and I trained Miller. And, yeah, and the last guy didn't show up. Okay. Who yeah. was the producer that you trained? Nathan. Okay. Do you remember his last name? Mm, no, not really. He was on set a lot. He was like a nice, uh, nice younger one, kind of. Okay. How long would you say you spent with each group training? Uh, with each actor, probably like mm, 30, 20 minutes okay. or so. Yeah, usually I like to work with the actors one-on-one -on -one and get like a full 30 minutes to an hour in, you know? But that's just not how it went on this one. Who made that call? Uh, Gabri Gabrielle. Okay. Did she give you a time limit? She just put three people together. Like, she scheduled it like that, and she said they had other things to do and had other, you know, they had to go and do training with the Wranglers. And a lot of this training was, like, the it's day the before. Yeah, they're like, ride a horse now, and now you get to shoot a gun. And, like... Yeah, you get to shoot a gun off before. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> it's crazy because a lot of the times they have actors start working with the horses like months in advance because you can grasp grasp the guns a little quicker than like a weird living animal and all that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, they didn't have people training on horses well in advance for this either, which I thought was pretty wild. And then a total off subject, but. I was, you know, we brought Jensen in here and spoke to him, and I found out that the gentleman who provided the horses for this set, I used to actually be a wrangler for him. Oh, really? Oh, boy, That's yeah. fun. Isn't he so cute? His horses are terrifying. Yeah, no, the horses are scary. I, I 
Honestly, I was trying to get out of Westerns because every Western I'm on, a horse almost killed me. Yeah. Shit you not. Like, horses back up crazy. And, like, no one even said, like, not to walk behind the horses on this. And I was like, Sarah, Sarah. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, you know, I was just, like, the complete lack of just, like, yeah. Yeah, I used to wrangle for him. And yeah. He I love that. Guy, he's, he's a sweetheart. But, yeah, the horses are bad. But, honestly, like, it's been a long time since I've been able to work with any really good horses because I have been doing independence. You know, no one can afford, like, the good horses that Magnificent Seven had back when I was there in 15, you know. Well, he used to do all kinds of, like, trail rides and stuff like that, too. But, I mean, he, I can tell you, like, because he goes, when they do trail rides, they go up, you know, that mountain that has a cross on it down at the end of Bonanza? So he used to take the horses up that mountain. Yeah. And I just remember one day he put me on a, on a uh, thoroughbred that came off the track a mare and like sh- she was hot she was a hot horse yeah and so he like slightly drugged her up before oh, wow. this trail ride and yeah. like I remember a couple of the horses <laughs> she was off in her own world we'll just say that oh, yeah man. a couple of the horses got loose on this one like made a full ass run for it like wow. three times during one scene uh they did their best they could to catch and eventually they started catch okay we're gonna break for the evening um remember this is what uh a couple more hours on this maybe Less than a couple, I'm sorry. Right. Less than a couple, but it, we've still got quite a ways to go. Okay. Um, so that, if I can judge, just yeah. for the record, we stopped this redacted video at one hour and five minutes. Okay, so we will uh, carry this on tomorrow. Uh, this will be what we uh, queue up with. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Don't do any research. Don't look up the, 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 the movie set or this case or anything. Thank you. Have a good evening. See you at 8.30 downstairs. All rise.